la wa la wa la wa wa we still got the fire burning we still got the water flowing a la wa Shalom to the tribe. Welcome back to the greatest investigation on earth. <laughs> the Preston John investigation. Installment number 98, my naga. Oh, we turn it up, man. If you ain't here for the tribe, you need to exit out the back door. I know who got the fire burning, man. Yeah. My aqua. <laughs> My aqua got the fire burning. Hey, shallow warm to the aquas, man. You know, when you stare at a picture and they look so familiar, like, man, I, I know this aqua. <laughs> it's like one of those aquas that's in every family, every Naga family. Got an aqua that look just like this, man. The more I, you know, dig on this aqua from Algier, they call her a black Moorish woman, a Moresque. <laughs> yeah, we do it for the aquas around here, man. Y'all better back back. It's Preston John, 98. You better back back, man. If you ain't here for the try, for the Shabbata, for Hawa, Halawa. We keep the cold. Cold keepers. This aqua is a cold keeper, man. White linen gold thread on an aqua. Like she got some pomegranate earrings, man. <laughs> aqua, you know, she laid out, man. She laid out, man. It's my aqua right here, man. White linen gold thread. Blue, purple, red. It don't seem like her outfit is more than an outfit, you know. And these do seem like little pomegranates, man. Seem like her outfit is like made out of some impenetrable <laughs> high technology, you know, like some dragon flow, you know, like it's impervious to, to fire. <laughs> this is like a superhero's outfit, man. You know what I mean? Aqua popping off, man. <laughs> Yeah, she popping off all the way, man. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just digging on this. I don't know, man. It seemed like a, a a dragon queen, you know what I mean? Even her back looked like um this type of leather, you know, this type of not even leather, man, like you know what I mean? High tech, high tech. It's beautiful, man. You know, what's this golden, this golden braid, man, man, this is some, all this looks like technology to me, man, like some armor. That's what I meant, you know, like some armor like, um, man, what's that Marvel movie? And they're all in this type of dragon armor, man. It's a little, it looks like some dragon armor, man. All right, I'm just going to say it. It looks like some dragon armor. Man, some type of green dragon armor type of flow, man. I mean, aqua is popping way off, man. Y'all got to go ahead and pay attention to the aqua a little bit, man. <laughs> they say the aqua is from Algiers. 
what they say. Let's back it up. They say my aqua right here. It's from Algier. And we get to thinking about Morocco and we like, yeah, all right, well, we know Algier is always next to Morocco. 1856, we know a lot's happening in 1856. I mean, <laughs> Ishmael's still migrating and stuff, you know. <laughs> it's all happening over here. And we know Algier. It's very close to Morocco, and we got Morocco over here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so where's Algier? Where would be Algier if Morocco's over here? Then I got the surfing the wave in your comments, man, because like I'm telling y'all, y'all the reason we on the road to Preston John 100, my night. Uh, uh. Uh, M-H-O-E, man. My noggin's still popping off, man. Noggin's is popping off, man. Hey, shout out to Melvin Harrison. No knowledge, no lodge the most. Hunter for Chan. Lil Man. Dragon Slay. OGXR626. Let's focus on this. Oh, shout out to my Aqua Jackie Anthony. She's over there dropping that drop. I think I pulled up some of her drop around here. If not, we're going to pull it up. Aqua Jackie, we appreciate your recon as always. You're such a big part of this investigation. I'm glad you've been able to see it through to the end, which is really the beginning. You know, the end is the beginning. Getting the press of John 100 is the end of, you know, this particular push, you know what I'm saying? but it's also the beginning of a brand new push, you know, that we're going to be exclu exclusive right there at 432thedrop.com. We ain't going nowhere. We're just not going to give YouTube all this drop no more, man. You know, we'll still do some drop on YouTube, but pretty much, you know, we're going to be running our flow, you know, at home. You know, we'll be at home. Anybody that wants some home cooking, come over here to 432thedrop.com. Jackie Anthony going to be there. <laughs> we all the way up. So, yeah. Hey, uh, I mean, y'all got us here. I don't, I don't know, you know, a lot of my noggins that's dropping this drop, you know, a lot of people brand new to surfing the wave, you know, as far as in this fifth wave that, that we got popping off, look out for the fifth wave because I'm pushing so hard to get to 100 this week. I'll be ready to push the fifth wave. You know what I'm saying? At 432thedrop.com and, you know, shout out to the ether squad. So the water for bearing with me, you know, allow me to get this off my chest <laughs> clear the space out so I can come in brand new for the fifth wave and get ready, you know what I mean, to be popping off exclusively at 432thedrop.com. Download the app, my naga. Please download the app for free in your uh, app store, 432thedrop radio. And, uh, you know, enjoy the Eat the Squad. Enjoy the, the new schedule that should be going up by Sunday. And we all the way up, man. And the waterfall, your support, all your contributions. And, you know, this is some of the greatest contribution right here. These comments, man. OGXR says what? Algiers is near or located near the mouth of the Mississippi River. And I said, whoa. We popping up. We popping up. We popping up. I found the queen, y'all. Oh, we found the aqua. <laughs> she popping up. Uh, uh, ooh, uh, uh, she popping up. Uh, 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 she popping up. They trying to throw the aqua away across the world, across the plane. And we say, nah, man. The last time that I checked, Algier is pretty near Morocco. Yeah. Algier, Morocco, Algier, Morocco, Algier, Morocco. Every map has Algier connected to Morocco. We said, cool. So that's good to know. And it's always like this big chunk of Algeria 
and Morocco's a little smaller. Then you got Tunisia. Tunisia, Tunisia, Tunisia. Tunisia. Why does that remind me of Tennessee? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we just pop it off. Tunisia, Tennessee. Tunisia, Tennessee. I don't know. Could be something. Could be nothing. But Algeria is connected to Morocco, my nigga. Yeah. Morocco is here. You did. Kankaki, we got to talk Kankaki. We're going to talk uh, Kankakawa. I think that's how they say it. Kankahua. The indigenous Nagas, you know, all this Juneteenth business is really, you know, around this Galveston, Texas flow. It has a lot to do with this Kankahua. <laughs> and we're going to dig on some of these, you know, indigenous Nagas. It's, it's just as important as the Kumse flow. You know, we got the, the Kumse flow flow popping off where it's popping off. And at the same time, because Nagas is at war, <laughs> you know, all this is still happening um, everywhere. You know what I'm saying? So we got to start talking to Texas. And I mean, all this is connected. Again, man, um, <laughs> shout out to my queen, man, Chef, <laughs> Chef Condi, man. We was looking at this, I guess they'll call it a busk, 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 you know. But, you know, statue, half statue. <laughs> and uh i'm like yeah this is supposed to be in morocco like Algier, you know over there you know the middle you know or you know north africa right north africa it's supposed to be in north africa you know we know we're in uh northwest of maxim right northwest africa remember them moorish maps but she said yeah but the articles from the detroit Institute of Arts, and I said, damn, 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 right under Lake Michigan is Morocco. <laughs> I said, Chef Condi, we popping up. I mean, why would the Detroit Museum of Arts have the aqua? <laughs> and Detroit is right underneath or, you know, right above Morocco, Morocco, Morocco. <laughs> yeah, man. It's a more and more war, man. So this aqua. You know, this publishing has everything to do with the Detroit Institute of Arts, man. <laughs> and they want to talk Algeria. 1856, right? And Algier is over here, is over where, is over here. Because Morocco's over here. Huh? If Morocco's over here and Algier is connected to Morocco, Morocco's right here, then right around here must be Algier. What the Aki say, man? Or, Aqua, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Algiers is located near the mouth of the Mississippi River. Oh, you mean like the Nile River? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. We locating the Aqua. You know, we are locating the Aqua. They try to put her in Algier over there, but Algiers over here, located near the mouth of the Mississippi River. It is the west bank of the greater New Orleans area. Oh, we pop in. Welcome to the greatest investigation in the history of YouTube. <laughs> We did it together, Drive Nation, man. Any award 
I get, we get, you know what I'm saying? We share, you know, this flow, this priest king, priest queen, aqua, ak, ama, apa, frame and shaper. We got the flow, we popping up. We share this frequency, it's unraveling all the mysteries and that's why we can't keep giving it to YT, man, YouTube. Plus they still got like two strikes on your boy. So, you know, they can, you know, pop off at any time. Another reason why I'm going in, they just making me go in. I'm going in, you know what I'm saying? So one more strike, who knows, man, but you know, after I get to 100, I ain't even going to be tripping. You know what I'm saying? After I get to 100, I know we did it. We hit our mark, man. I'm ready to pop off and take the wheel at 432 to drop radio exclusively. Man. Algiers is over here, man. Algiers is over here. We already know it because Morocco's over here. And we said, where's Algiers? The Aki heard me say it. And he said, hey, Algiers located near the mouth of the Mississippi River. It is the West Bank of the greater New Orleans area. It is also the site of many naval installations, some that have closed over the last 10 to 15 years. Many historical records show ship departures from the port Algiers Point. So they got a port called Algiers Point, my name. <laughs> and it's a port just like Morocco, just like Morocco. <laughs> I mean, hey, I can't make this stuff up, man. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. My goodness. Algier over there also has a bunch of ports. Algiers. <laughs> oh, man, this is crazy. Cur I got I, I to gotta get it back. North Africa, yeah. We're in Africa, right? I gotta get it big. <laughs> so on the top of this Algeria, they got Algiers Point up here. This is Algiers right at the, you know, right in the middle, right in the point. And it's connected all this to the Mediterranean Sea, very strategically you know this is where they set up shop this is uh tennessee i mean uh tunisia <laughs> tunisia 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 tennessee 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 <laughs> take me to another you already know it man focus on these three man that means everything is over here, boss. Mali, Timbuktu, the Niger, the Naga. <laughs> Focus on the big three right here, man. And if Morocco's over here, Thing near connected to Spain, and we're Spain. You know what I'm saying? We're Spain, man. You know? All this looks like a a farce now. All this looks like some made up stuff in the recent, you know, ages. You know, this is recent makeover. Because if this ain't Algeria, and if this ain't Morocco, <laughs> and if this ain't Tennessee, uh, Tunisia, then what is it? It can't be barbarian because they're not the barbar. They're not the swan. The swan is the America. I mean, they telling on themselves. So with this Algiers point, man, <laughs> caught him slipping, boss. Caught him slipping, boss. It's too easy. Some of your comments, I can do a whole 
impressed with John just based on your comment. You know what I mean? Because it connects. It's so wavy. It's just so wavy. And I ain't talking Navy. <laughs> but I am talking out Jerry's point. You know what I'm saying? And I guess that's the point. We all point, man. We, we all point. I mean, let's wrap this. Let's wrap our noodle around this, man. This is mind blasting information. OG XR. Not everyone got this drop. You know what I'm saying? But everyone got a drop. And with all this drop, we got a wave. And all the waves are connected from the beginning to now to the future. It's all the water. It's all that mem sauce. Algiers is located near the mouth of the Mississippi River. Or the now, and when you think about this Egypt flow, wouldn't they set up shot right there by the now? Egypt? Hmm. Okay. Okay, boss. Okay, boss. Okay. Just remember the Treaty of Fort Wayne with these <sighs> treacherous Nagas. <laughs> we got real Nagas and we got treacherous Nagas. Gave up 20, 29 million seven hundred and nineteen thousand five hundred and thirty acres in one treaty of Naga land for the settlers of Illinois and Indiana. Indianapolis, Illinois, Indiana. Muhammad, Mecca, Morocco. This is where they set up shop. So that treaty of Fort Wayne, they were, they did it <laughs> because it was feeding them. It was them making an alliance, which, which is why they didn't need to inform to Coop, say, the Shawnee. They didn't need to inform the Creek about this or the Seminole about this. Why? Because it was benefiting them. This was benefiting these hijacks making a covenant against you. The Combsay couldn't tribe them up because they were the masterminds behind the whole thing. You know, imagine going to try to tribe up with someone who has masterminded the plan against you. Illinois and Indiana, 30 million acres of land given up just like that to the settlers. Who's settling, my naga? <laughs> this, this ain't hard to do. <laughs> this ain't hard to do, man. The tribe of Ishmael migration, 1785 to 1905. <laughs> Who's settling? In 1809, that you're giving up 30 million acres of land uh, to the settlers. Who are the settlers? Who is migrating? Come on, man. You got caught red-handed again. So that 30 million acres went to benefit you. Got them boss. Stay happy about this tree, man. Our ancestors, oh, I, I hope we are fulfilling their hopes and dreams by being here. Our ancestors. We're so happy to give up 30 million acres of land. No, they're happy because they got 30 million acres for themselves. And right after this, the Kumse went to war. And all the Nagas went to war. The real Nagas, not the treacherous Nagas. Whew. Let's go.
So they got Algiers Point over there. And AIB to OG, the OG XR626. <laughs> Many historical records show ship departures from that port, that port, Algiers Point, to many ports, parts of the Central and South America and Caribbean lands. You know, when I think Carib, I think Arab, we're gonna talk Arab, you know, Arab proper. We're gonna, we're gonna talk some Arab proper. We're going to let our foot off the neck, Bo, of Hijack City. Hijacking everything. We're taking everything back, boss. We're taking everything back, boss. Hey, love to the bro, man. So Algiers is over here, and that got me looking at Algiers, you know, over here, man. As long as we got the water flowing and the fire burning, we good. The aquas in Algiers, y'all. <laughs> New Orleans. Uh, if you got that drop on our IG about that whole lost city popping up out of Louisiana. <laughs> they found a whole lost city, a whole Naga city. I mean, we see that they have flooded our cities, right? We're just talking Louisiana. You know, this is where my dad's people from, you know what I mean? Louisiana, New Orleans, all this, man. So, uh, you know, this, Georgia, South Carolina, you know, all, all of us got these roots, man. So they say first settled in 1719, annexed by the city in 1870, I'm, I'm just talking Algiers. Things to do, hop on a ferry and head to old Algiers. Old Algiers for leisurely sightseeing, I bet. And one of the best views of New Orleans skyline you ever see. Old Algiers, huh? How old, man? <laughs> yeah, it ain't playing. Built up along the riverfront, 1719 Algiers is New Orleans' second oldest neighborhood, home to four to five generations of local families <laughs> and rich with history dating back to the colonial period. Okay. Old Algiers, huh? How much y'all want to bet that these old buildings been here long before Columbus? Like old Morocco, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, old Morocco, man. Old Algiers. That's all they give us? <laughs> That's it? Oh, man, y'all on that play, play around here, boss. Y'all on that play, play, man. Let's dig on some. <laughs> Some Algiers drop, man, because you see it. So Algiers was founded on the west bank of the Mississippi River a year after New Orleans was founded. Let's dig on this one. You know, we're just going to surf the wave on some drop, man. Aqua, she's been here a long time, right? Historic neighborhood of Algiers Point. Okay. Okay. Come on, man, with a history. Here we go. <laughs> Initially, this area was called King's Plantation. <laughs> like a slave plantation in Algeria, like slavery in Morocco. Whoa. And it was where enslaved Africans were held after their arrival in Algeria. History of slavery in Algeria. (laughs) 
So slavery finally got abolished in Algeria by the French in 1848. Uh, we're talking about a town they say was set up in the 1700s and was where the slaves used to go, <laughs> where they first stepped off the boat. Where this Arab thing, I, you know, I, I said I'm talking some Arab job and they bring up some Arab connections, man. This is getting crazy, man. This is getting crazy. Oh, we're just talking Nigeria. Yeah. Oh, Morocco, Arab. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it. Now we're talking Arab proper. The Barbary slave trade refers to slave markets on the Barbary coast of North Africa, which included the Ottoman states of Algeria, Tunisia, and Tripolitania, and the independent Sultanate of Morocco between the 16th and 19th centuries. Khan, that's around the same time as the Little Ice Age, right? It's all making sense. It's all making sense. So European slaves were acquired by Barbary pirates <laughs> in slave raids on ships and by raids on coastal towns from Italy to Netherlands. So this is when you got a lot of white slaves, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> when we said, oh, well, you got you white slaves over there and then you send them on boats over here and now they want titles because they're getting out of slavery so they take the titles of the indigenous cons con the coming together of opposites con yeah that's how you slay the dragon the alchemical dragon that's that cadmus So slavery has everything to do with Algeria over there. Come huh? check. Slavery has everything to do with Algeria over here. <laughs> God, man, I'm out of here, man. I'm out of here, boss. It's Preston 98, man, we out of here. Come on, man. Let's go. Let's go. I'm going to do this for my nagas that need this. You know what I'm saying? My nagas that need this, this water, this fire. This is amazing, Dr. <laughs> I'm, I'm just pulling the blinks at this point. <laughs> I got some things I wrote down a long time ago. I didn't even got to that stuff. I'm just pulling out. I'm just, we just dropping that drop. We just popping off, man. Let's go. Initially, this area was called King's Plantation. What's the king? Who's the king? Talking about King Charles in it? <laughs> and it was where enslaved Africans or indigenous Americans that were put in captivity were held after their arrival in the region before they were ferried to New Orleans. You had to check in in Algiers. Morocco, because they were controlling the slave trade. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. yeah, boss. We see you now, boss. When the, when the Spanish gained control of Algiers, they sold off much of the property to private owners and plantations sprung up. Bang, bang, bang after the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. Left the Coup Mayo covering a lot of this as well. Algiers gained a more diverse population, including Americans, Germans, Irish, and Italians. Oh yeah, everyone's welcome to the promised land. Everyone's welcome to the promised land, let's go. It's a melting pot now. Industry in this neighborhood included shipbuilding, lumber, wax, sugar, coal, de coal depot, stockyards. In 1850s, Algiers became a major hub 
in the railroad industry where freight and passengers were moved across the Mississippi <laughs> on barges. Passengers, right? <laughs> Let's go. Because <laughs> they migrated. 1895, a great fire destroyed about 200 homes. Whoa, that's a big fire. That's a, that sounds like dragon fire. You know what I'm saying? That sounds like dragon fire. 200 homes with one fire? I'm not gonna pull up the last time 200 homes got lost with a single fire. In Algiers, in Louisiana, including the Duvergy Plantation House, which had been used as the courthouse. So this, this house right here probably got a whole lot of trap. You know, this is like headquarters, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is like hijack headquarters right here, man. I'm just popping off with y'all, man. Don't, don't mind me. Okay. The Duver, Duvergy, Duvergy, Duvergy plantation. Algiers Point involved, evolved from the plantation of Bartholomew Duverge. The Duverge home was built in 1812 through 1816. It's crazy. It sounds like around the same time as the Tecumseh War. Matter of fact. I'm not gonna, I think it's exactly the same time as the Tecumseh War. <laughs> so while Israel, the prophet Tenskata Hawa, are getting mowed down by General Harrison and all the hijacks, push Mataha. All these tribes are fighting against tech, against Israel. They're building stuff. They're migrating. They're getting 30 million acres of land. They're getting, you know, Ohio. <laughs> They're getting all these things in one big swoop. They're getting everything. They're getting all your stuff. Now, was it built then or was it, <laughs> that's the <laughs> $65 million question. Was it just built then, do you believe it? Or was it already there and they just took it over? You know what I mean? That's what's, you know, that's what we need to know. It serves as, served as the Algiers courthouse. So what's the chances? Come on, man. Hold up, man. He's back it up for a minute. Algiers is located near the mouth of the Mississippi River. It was the West Bank of the greater New Orleans area. We're talking where the slaves were coming before they go to New Orleans. They had to go through Algiers and then they got ferried off, man. And who's controlling Algiers? Morocco. It's a more and more war. It is also the site of many naval installations. <laughs> I bet it's a treaty of peace and friendship, right? We're talking about the port. Many historical records show ship departures from that port, Algiers Point, to many parts of Central and South America and the Caribbean. We're talking Algiers, 1856. We got you, Aqua. <laughs> she said, you got me. Aqua, we got you. Let's go. She said, did you find me? Aqua, we know where you at. 
We know where you at. It was destroyed by the great fire of Algiers in 1895 and replaced by the current courthouse in 1896. So all they got is sketches because the real one was destroyed and it was a, this current one built now. It might be something like this now. Something like what it could have looked like before, you know what I mean? More recent, probably after the fire, so. Came a courthouse, right? <laughs> yeah, practicing that law, huh? <laughs> Them sciences and laws. So I guess it would have looked like today, you know what I mean? We're just talking old Algiers. Algiers Point. Managa, I can't make this stuff up. Okay. So that's the Dervergy Plantation now. Destroyed by dragon fire with 200, <laughs> 200 homes, maybe, man. Just surfing a wave in Algiers, man. So we see clearly that, you know, it's a lot going on. Crossing the Mississippi River. <laughs> I mean, all this sounds too biblical, right? Settled 300 years ago. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. Let's keep going. So we're talking Louisiana. Let's talk to Texas. Let's talk to Texas, man. Let's talk the Karan Kawa people. And left all my noggins dropping on this on IG, um, you know, wherever you're dropping it. I'm seeing it, man, connected with this Juneteenth, and it's also connected directly with our investigation. Who's the Karan Kawa people? Kora, right? All this Kara business, right? <laughs> the Karan Kawa, and you'll see why I say that in a second were an indigenous people centralized in Southern Texas, shout out to Tote, Texas, along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Largely in the lower Colorado River and Brazos River valleys, they consisted of several independent seasonal nomadic groups. <laughs> All right, that's, that's just wanderers, right? Just wanderers <laughs> going from place to place who shared the same language and much of the same culture from the onset of European colonization, the Karankawa had violent encounters with the Spanish. Now you're gonna read about some of this and, hey, these Karas were nobody's play play. They whooped the Spanish ass, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a big deal. I'm glad we finally get to it because we were talking Shikamagua, but at the same time the Shikamagua's it's popping off. You got this Karankawa popping off. And are they separate people? We know the Shikamawa didn't call themselves the Shikamawa. So we're going to match up, you know, what's happening in Tote, Texas with what's happening, you know, throughout this whole Shikamawa flow. You know what I'm saying? Uh, where were they first at? Dragon Canoe. I think they started around Tennessee or Oklahoma. Shikamawa. Um, 
Ne? Chica Marga Cherokee refers to a group that's separated from the greater body of Cherokee. So of all these we the people, all right, we're talking Kara, right? <laughs> Cherokee is also Kara Ka. Woo! I think we're talking the same nugget. Body bag for the illusion. Could we talking to Kara Ka Kawa or Kara Kahawa? We're talking Kara Ki. Karaka, Cherokee, right? But we don't say the CH like ch. It's always a hard K in our ancient languages. So we don't have no ch China. It's Kana, Kenna, Kana, Khan. House of the Khan is China, but they moved it over there. <laughs> when China, Kana is over here. Home of the Karaka, the Karaka, Cherokee. So Dragon Canoe, you know, is their con at the time in 1776 when all these American Revolutionary Wars is popping off, which wasn't about no British versus American. It was about a more and more war for the promised land. So the followers of Ski Gusta or Red Chief, Dragon Canoe, Dragon Canoe. Move with him in the winter of 1776 to 1777 down the Tennessee or the Tunisia River. <laughs> Away from the historical or real town. And then Tecumseh, you know, links up and, you know, he, he's, he's a young one when they pop off, but then he grows and starts leading his own, you know, uh, war against the hijack. That's when you get to Kumsey's return right here. You know what I mean? And it's all happening. So we're asking some very pivotal questions right now, man, about these cars. Car a car. And this Tennessee flow, too. The car a car, which is Cherokee, my not. <laughs> Kahawa, these are the same Nagas as the Cherokee. And these specific Nagas we digging on that was whooping up on the Spanish are the same as the so called because they're named after a river of death, but Chicamagawa, which still has the Hawaii at the end because the UA is Wa, Wa, H U A, even that. Silent G. Wah, like Agua, Agua, Agua. So it's all Hawa, no matter if you're looking at the Chickamauga Wa. <laughs> yeah. And who's enslaving the Chickamauga? Morocco, Tunisia, Tunisia. Tunisia reminds me of uh, Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee. Through a winding, through a swerving, Tunisia, Tunis, <laughs> Tunisia or Tanasia. You put an A at the end, you got Tanasia, Tunisia, Tunisia, Tanisia. You put an A at the end of Tennessee, you got Tanisia or Tunisia. They just put a T-U and hope you don't see through <laughs> the bull crap, right? But if Algeria is over here, because Morocco is over here, and they're migrating while they're getting all this 30 million acres of land, just talking about Morocco. We know Algeria is connected to Morocco, then Tunisia or Tennessee. So while these Nagas in Tennessee is popping off, or Tunisia, yeah. 
Tanisha. Put a T A is Tana C. <laughs> oh shit. We out of here, man. Hey, we popping up. We seeing clearly 360 Dragonfly perspective. So rock with me. Just rock with me. It's getting good. Rock with me. It's about to get better. Tunisia is Tanasi. Tanisia. Tanasia is Tunisia. Come. Winding River. And Korean T N T E N E S I Tennessee Japanese Tanishi Tanishi Tanishi. <laughs> yeah, what does Tennessee mean? I don't know, man. What they say? I don't see nothing, man. They don't know. Look like they might not know, boss. Huh. They said, they said, did you actually mean Tunisia? <laughs> I said, what does Tennessee mean? They said, you mean Tunisia, boss? <laughs> and what kind of noggins did they encounter in Tunisia, Tennessee? Them Cherokee, them Karaka, right? Them uh, Chikamago that was fighting back, fierce and violent. They encountered some dragons, which would make them tenacious. Tunisia is tenacious, is Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee. Take me to another play. Hey, talking Tunisia, man. Okay. <laughs> Aqua, we got you. There's one thing you need to know is that the tribe got you. Let's go. Because you're in Algiers and we're just talking Algeria. 1800s, we're talking about that too. We got you, Aqua. You in 1856? Yeah, we got you, Aqua. It's, it's all happening. And the comparison, you know, that you're about to see going on, right? Because 1856, even when Tecumse went down already, the same Seminole that started with him, same Seminole that started with Tech, was still by his side. Was still tribing up with the tribe, even in 1856. Now you got the Texas Indian Wars, which are the Karan Kahawa or Karan Kahawa. Southwest Indian Wars, Navajo Wars, California Indian Wars, everybody at war. No, but they're in a America Revolutionary War. That <laughs> and that ended. That's over, right? Yeah. America Revolutionary War over, right? The, their revolution is over. You know what a revolution is, man? Complete takeover. Whether we're talking Chicamagua, the Karaka Cherokee, or the Karankawa, Texas Nagas that we're getting off in Galveston, Texas, man. You know what I'm saying? That's the same Cherokee, the same Karaka that we're talking about here. So it's Karankawa. We're about to get this history 
Love to the fam, man. Um, see if I got. Okay, well, I'm just going to call him the car on car. Why? <laughs> Nation. What it do? You'll see here that it's also spelled what? With a C. Car on car. But you see the end is now changed to H-U-A. Right now we're talking about the Karankawa. Karankahawa, H-U-A, Awa. Bay is a northern extension of Matagorda Bay, located in Jackson and Matagorda counties in Texas. Talking Texas Indian Wars. Texas Indian Wars. Texas Indian Wars. You see how we are putting the pieces together because the this can't be no different than the Cherokee, right? They're just renaming the war, but now they're making their way into this total Texas and they've been already scrapping with the Spanish by this time. <laughs> they've been scrapping the whole time in Texas. They even got a street named after the Karan Kahawa, spelled with a C, but with the H U A at the end. <laughs> Karan Kahawa Street. They're naming all these streets after these indigenous Nagas, man. We're gonna talk about this Corpus Christi, man, because I think this is the town that they put the street in. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. It's crazy talk. Karan Kahawa Bay. Right. <laughs> a wise name is everywhere. We're about to get on the importance of this because whether we're talking the Chikamakawa or Joshua or Hawaii or Ki Hawa you know what I mean? Like a wise name is everywhere in our indigenous flow. The Nahawato, Hawa Hawa. I am that I am. We're talking existence. You want to exist on your land. You want to exist as a car, as a car and ka, or car a key, or Cherokee, car a ka. Oriented from the southeast to the northwest, but meanders as it reaches the north to the confluence with car and ka, Hawa Creek. So they got a creek named Karankahawa. Since the name Karankahawa derives from the term that formerly referred to the Karankahawa Indians. So why would they now put the Hawa at the end of it unless it was already there? You just got to put these two spellings together and you're going to get the correct spelling. <laughs> Karankahawa. Hawa who resides on his shores, Texas Spanish Royal Governor Martin Martin de Alacon was the first documented European to tour the bay. So we're gonna talk about every time it was torn this tour in the bay that was getting torn up. <laughs> they just talking bays, right? We we still talking Algeria. <laughs> we still talking bays. Let's go. Talking bays and L's, man, you know. How does it relate to Juneteenth? Let's talk about that. Uh, June 19, 1865. Whoa. That's really close to this 1856 date. Let's just keep my aqua in mind. 
my aqua right now is the centerpiece of our investigation, man. Cause we're just talking Algiers, Louisiana. We're just talking Louisiana now. So when they say Algiers, we talking Louisiana. <laughs> All right, let's go. We're talking New Orleans. <laughs> Con? Con, Con, let's go. 1865, General Granger announced the end of slavery from the balcony of the Ashton Villa in Galveston, Texas. Texas. Now, was it the end of slavery or was it just getting started? <laughs> How could it be the end of slavery, my Nagi, when you're still at war? So what happened to the captives of the Nagas? <laughs> in these wars from here to the Philippines, right? Slavery wasn't over for them because you're still fighting for your lives. You weren't no homeborn slave brought over here on a boat. They just found you here, man. You've been fighting the whole time. You ain't no slave. <laughs> they had to bring in slaves until their Algiers point or whatever Indian captives, you know what I'm saying? And, ship them here and ship them there with their ferry boats or slave boats. They call them ferry boats because in some uh, mythologies, the fairies are the dragons and the dragons are the fairies. So these are the boats that they were shipping the dragons around. Man. We see clearly. Galveston Island was a slavery empire. We're still talking Algeria. Founded by French pirate John Lafitte. French pirate John Lafitte. Who's who want to bet he's a naga, man? <laughs> who want to bet he's a nigga, man? Right? He was financed by two brothers, Jewish traders, Joa and Maureen de la Porte. Yeah, the Jewish have been behind and funding and in league with this confederacy they were known as karankawa traders and supercargoes for lafitte growing incredibly wealthy and discriminating the indian population all called karankawa subsequently deemed and sold as african or negro slaves so first they are called karankawa <laughs> You went from Karankawa to African, Negro, slaves. Is Israel a homeborn slave for the booming cotton trade? You went from Karanka, from the Cherokee, Karanka, to African, man. I need you just to think about that. Galveston was not just a random or haphazard place picked to announce the emancipation of slaves in Texas. It was a territory harboring a slave trading empire that refused to give up its practices and broke away from Mexico because of slavery had been abolished and insisted Texans free all slaves within six months of settlement. The secession produced the Republic of Texas general James Long aimed to liberate Texas from Spanish rule. But we was already fighting the Spanish. <laughs> we was already fighting the Spanish. Let's go. And formed a slave laundering venture with Lafitte, a Gulf of Mexico pirate. The importation of slaves into the United States Corporation had been banned since 1808. However, it was legal to buy and sell slaves who were already in the country. Ping, pow. When they got here, they met a bunch of aquas that looked just like this aqua here, man. She went from Karanka to African with a stroke of a pen. 
Hey, Naga's building in Nagaville. This looks like the Nagaville uh, Joy World fence, man. That's cray cray. <laughs> Naga's been building fences for a long time, I see. <laughs> Let's go, man. So this is crazy, man. So it was legal to buy and sell slaves who were already in America, which are the Indians, right? Lafitte's gang would capture indigenous Nagas, indigenous Texans from its coast who were cinnamon colored with negroid features as well as from ships in the gulf of mexico and Car caribbean they smuggled them either to lafitte's base at galveston in texas or to bowie's island in vermilion bay west of new orleans lafitte's army captured an indian made brewing the hostility between general long's wife jane the Karankawa Indians during the colonization of Texas first colony, Austin colony. <laughs> Shout out to my Nagas in Austin, man. Five eyes, I know you paying attention. Kia Long, also known as Kian or Kia Mata. So let's back this up. Says Lafitte's army captured an Indian made brewing oh an indian maid okay there we go <laughs> so she's an indian maid she's an indigenous con which brewed hostility between general long's wife jane and the karankawa indians during the colonization of texas's first colony austin colony kia long also known as Kia or Kia Mita, Mata. Any references to Kia is that of a slave made without any other supporting details of our history. So they captured this Naga queen, man, this Aqua. She only appears in literature and proximity in Galveston throughout Texas in the midst of Karankahua hostility and revengeful attitudes of retaliation towards colonizers in Opata territory. Could it be Kia Long is the Indian May capture brewing the hostility between Jane Long, Karakawa Indians, and Lafitte's army during the colonization of Texas? We get this last part. It says slave and lifelong companion of Jane Long, 13 year old. Keon and Jane spent a freezing winter alone. Why is it freezing in Texas? Because <laughs> it's the end of an ice age. Across from Galveston in 1828, while Texas was still part of Spain. Hmm. The women survived by shooting birds and catching fish and they shared with their loyal dog. Because the women were afraid of the Karankawa Indians who lived nearby, they ran a red flannel petty, petticoat up the flagpole and periodically fired off the cannon to give the impression that the fort was still protected by soldiers. So that's Jane and Kit, who herself is a Karankawa. <laughs> Now she's being taught to fear them. They got their red flag up, right? <laughs> their, their red flannel. All right. James Long died, leaving Jane to become a very wealthy landowner with the first land grants colonies of Texas. Should she get a grant? Nah. She's, you know, Jane is General Long's wife now. Jane could be herself a car, a car. You know, he could have took it, taken an, a, a Texas, you know, indigenous sister as well. So I don't want to say she's from anywhere. I, I don't know. We don't know. But she became a wealthy landowner with the first land grants, colonies of Texas, Austin Colony, and the title of the mother of Texas. Stealing the Aboriginal title from Texas's first family. So his wife hijacked 
the aboriginal title from the first families of Texas. She's the new mother of Texas. It's what she's, it's what this author's saying. That's crazy, man. Hey, ha, uh, man, that's, that's some deep drop. <laughs> they don't know what car kahawa means, right? We we can connect it to Cherokee, <laughs> but they have no idea. Let's let's you know look at some theories. The car kahawa name's origin is from the caves of El Paso. People worship it to this day. Worship what? The cave? Early speculation involves the name that neighboring tribes had for the car kahawa. The name Karamkawa was theorized to originate from related peoples living nearby who called the dog the term clam or glam and to love and to like. So they went to the dogs, man. Out of nowhere, they just start talking about dogs. <laughs> These dog heads, man, always want to bring dogs up, man, <laughs> bring dogs into the pitch. To like, to be fond of, Kawa. Okay. Thus, Car and Kahawa could mean dog lovers or dog raisers. Come on, man. <laughs> All that. Car and Kahawa, and they get dog lovers out of that. Meanwhile, the Tan Kahawa call themselves the wrestlers. So, along with the Car and Kahawa, you know, this, this represents a group of tribes like the Cherokee, because we're just talking Cherokee. And one of these, one of them is also called the Tan Kawa. You know what I mean? So they all got the Awa in their names. All right. Let's uh, see what else we got on this car. Kawa. And you know, Notice they got this street in Corpus Christi, right? Corpus Christi, Texas. Which is the ultimate slap in the face. <laughs> to name Hawaii's people or rename your new hijack area after their Christ, the corpse of Christ, Corpus Christi is talking about the, the body of Christ on these Hebrews, you know what I'm saying? And name a street after them in a city called the body of Christ because they were hijacked by Christians. Ain't that the ultimate slap in the face, man? This is crazy. I'm just looking up this Corpus Christi drop place name, you know. Let's see what we got. So you got Tan Ka Hawa Street. See, Hawa is everywhere. Hawa is everywhere, man. And that's the Tan Ka Hawa. So how did it go from Tan Kawa to the HUA? They did the same thing here with the Karakawa, but it's the Hawa. What's this Hawa about, my nigga? What's the Hawa Hawa all about? Karan Ka Hawa in Corpus Christi. Hey, that's Koran Kawa. Where's the Hawa? Let's go, man. Then they got Refuge County. So, it's a lot going on in Texas, man. It's a lot happening in Texas. Shout out to Yosef, man. This is Yosef Maria, Maria, or Moria. They say he's about, you know, around 1789. Now, this is going to seem like it's overlapping with what we know 
about the Shikamagua, the Cherokee, the Karaka, right? Kara, Ka, Karakawa, Kara. All right, all right. <coughs> Shala, let's go. <laughs> Get my water. I'm popping off. You know what I mean? And I'm just going, man. I'm going for it, man. Y'all, y'all with me? Let's go. Wow. We popping off. We popping off. We popping off. Let's take this amazing journey and just remember to comb say while we do, you know. Let's go. Yosef was the most prominent Karakawa figure during the Spanish Karakawa War in the late 18th century. So if he's the most prominent figure, Yosef, we must pay attention to this prom this Naga of prominence. What was he so prominent for? He united the tribes, my God. In the 1700s. Same time as the Shikamaga War. Same time that the Kumse is tribing them up to the best of his ability. <clears throat> and again, they're in Corpus Christi, which means what? Corpus, <laughs> a body, <laughs> a Christ body, yeah. They have a whole feast called Corpus Christi of their blessed sacrament kept on the Thursday after Trinity Sunday. The city of Texas is named after the bay, which was so called by Spanish explorer Alfonso Alvarez de Pineda, who discovered it on Corpus Christi Day in 1519. So he named the whole city after the Corpus Christi Day because he found it on the cop on this Christi Day. You know what I mean? <laughs> so he said, hey, I found new land on Corpus Christi Day. This is Corpus Christi Bay. Let's read about it. Yosef is the most prominent Karakawa figure during the Spanish Karakawa War in the late 18th century. He united different Karakawa peoples. He sparked the abandonment of Nuestra Senora del Rosario, the Rosario mission. He sparked the abandonment. That means he emptied house. He emptied the missionary house, man. <laughs> this Yosef is popping off, man. <laughs> Keep them drugs going for Yosef, man. We're just talking about Mo. You know, when we talk Mari, you know, more, we're talking about Mo. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're talking about that man. We're talking about yourself, right? <laughs> so. Wow. He sparked the abandonment of the Nuestra Senora de Rosario mission. And he demonstrated that the Karankawas held the most outstanding power on the Texas coastal bend. These dragons was popping off, man. Most outstanding power. Uh, 
of the Kawapai tribes of the Karakawas, Joseph Maria or More or Mu, grew up in and out of the mission Rosario, where he learned the Catholic faith and the Spanish language. So he learned a stuff. A lot of us grow up in these churches. We we learn the New Testament. We learn English, <laughs> but we still popping off. And this sounds like what Yosef is doing in the mid 1700s. The presidential captain Louis Carzola imprisoned Yosef because the Guapite or Qua, the G U A is like Agua, right? Awa. Leaders slaughtered a cow without Friar Joaquin de Escobar's permission. <laughs> All right, so they imprisoned him for slaughtering a cow. After being in prison for an undisclosed amount of time, Yosef escaped to the coast where he led a band of apostate native peoples. <laughs> they called them apostates because they weren't down with the faith. They turned, they abandoned the faith, right? <laughs> you know him for abandoning these their missions, man. <laughs> he made Nagas abandon their mission, man. Or, you know, he made the hijack abandon their mission and made Nagas abandon the hijack's mission. I mean, what was he really in prison for, man? So he led his Nagas on raids against all these hijacks, the Presidio La Bahia, and the missions on Rosero, Rosario and Nuestra Señora del Espíritu Santa de Zuniga. The Spaniards responded by sending expeditions unsuccessful and punitive in design that targeted all Caraca, all Cherokee, Caraca, wow. Not just those of Yosef, the tribe. They say, man, we're just talking tribe. So he's gathering a tribe to fight all hijacks, just like Tacoma say, man. Malaga, this is the press to hour. We're talking all the chiefs, man, all the priest kings, the chiefs rocking in code with our creator. Gathering the tribes of Israel, fighting against the hijacks that wish to invade the holy city. Because Columbus knew exactly where he was going, knew exactly what he wanted to do. Yeah, he know. To recover the holy city of Mount Zion is what Columbus in his own words is saying. He's having prophecies to invade Israel, my God, and discover you and convert you with their missions of the islands of the islands of the Indias and of all people, man, <laughs> and all nations for the Spanish crown. And who's fighting against these hijacks, man? Did you forget what the Spanish crown looked like? You forget what King Charles looked like? They're conquering the Holy City. They're conquering Jerusalem and Mount Zion. They're conquering the land of the Presta. This is the Presta hour, my God. You can't talk Presta without talking our Prestas right here at home, our priests, our chiefs, our kings, our queens that gave it all they had. Not everyone tribed up with the Karaka, Cherokee, Chicamagua, whatever you want to call them. But it's all happening at the same time, mid 1770s. So they tried to uh, target 
yourself but it was punitive unsuccessful in march 1778 yosef and 11 other car cars killed all the members <laughs> of this spaniard you know uh invasion expedition right they, they killed all the spaniards except for one louis antonio andre nautical expedition that was mapping texas bays this is what they were doing to anyone coming around trying to you know do recon on their homeland imagine someone coming up to your land mapping it out all the time like whoa fuck out of here hijack <laughs> the Caracawas murder of the shipwreck personnel had become normalized so this was, this was normal <laughs> they would uh shipwreck them that's why they were called pirates right these are the pirates my nine. so <laughs> they would take the shipwreck personnel or you know their stuff became normalized on the texas coast and ex exemplifies what little power the spanish had in the region because who had all the power the Karakahawas held the most outstanding power, the most outstanding power on the Texas coastal bed. So they would shipwreck these hijacks, take their things. <laughs> and that's how they were popping off, man. Harvesting these shipwrecks served as a valuable source of trade goods, man. <laughs> for the car come on man. They say hey you coming around here cool come on back come on back and they left one alive you know for whatever reason july 25th 1778 with a substantial amount of rifles bullets and powders acquired from andre's ship because they still took all his things it's louis antonio andre they, they left him alive but they still took his things, you know what I'm saying? Yosef and his tribe forced the abandonment of Mission Rosario. They forced the abandonment of the Spanish mission. 22 out of 31 remaining neophytes decided to accompany Yosef to the coast. So I guess this is 22 out of 31 people that were being taught in the missionary, the captain of La Bahia with 57 men sailed after the fleeing Caracawas, but Yosef's forces ambushed the chasing party, killed one pursuer and caused the rest of the Spanish troops to retreat. And just pay attention to the numbers, you know what I'm saying? These were like small skirmishes, but they led to bigger, you know, because it's all happening, you know what I mean? Like this was covering not just Yosef's group, but this was happening throughout all the Karakas and these Cherokees and these Shikamaguas, Dragon Canoe, Tacombe. Yosef. Three months later, the governor of Texas, Baron de Rapirdia granted a pardon for the neophytes, excluding Yosef and his companion, Mateo. But the runaway American Indians remained on the impenetrable coast. So he said, look, y'all could come back. <laughs> All y'all that helped him, I'll give you a pardon, but I need your help. <laughs> but nah, these Americans remain. The Spanish saw Yosef as the primary agitator among the coastal American Indians and believed that his death would result in the rest of the Karakawas returning to civilized life. If we kill the head, you know, take off the head of the snake, you know, that's how they're thinking about it. But they don't know they're dealing with dragons, <laughs> with multiple heads, Leviathan dragons, man. <laughs> we keep growing our heads back, right? And we keep popping on. The Spaniards concocted all manners of plans to apprehend or assassinate Yosef. 
they requested fake peace talks. <sighs> Setting up fake peace talks. Because he wasn't down for no treaties of pieces and friendship. Fake peace talks with the Karakawa leaders, but plan to hang yourself as soon as he appeared. They implored other Karakawa chiefs to capture him and imprison him. So other Cherokee, Karaka, were turning on yourself, just like the Cherokee and Tecumseh. The same thing was happening here, was happening there in Texas. This is why we are connecting directly to Texas. So what are you talking? I mean, when you talk Texas, you also talk in California, man. <laughs> you know, we got a strong connection. You know what I'm saying? And all oh, this is Kara Key or Kara Kawa. I mean, however you want to say. All oh, this is Shikamawa flow. So they said, man, we kill him, then we can civilize them. According to the Spaniards, Accordingly, the Spaniards concocted all manners of plans to apprehend Yosef. They requested fake peace talks, but planned to hang Yosef. They implored other Karaka chiefs to capture and imprison him. They jailed his bro, Jose Luis, <laughs> as leverage. And they even, they even discussed having a ship full of soldiers fake a shipwreck to lure the apostate Karakawas into a trap. Yet Yosef remained out of the Spanish reach and the conflict between the colonizers and the Karakawas increased as did their suspicion towards each other. Most significantly, the Karakawas suspect the Spaniards sought their absolute annihilation. Like this is what we know now, even today, our Nagas today still don't think the hijack wanna absolutely annihilate them. But they're doing it in their own special way. Chemtrails and, you know, um, stuff they want to put in your body, you know. <laughs> so they they plan for our annihilation, right? The Karaka knew that. Yosef knew that. He knew that the peace don't. I mean, come on, man. If, if you're more rich today looking at these treaties of peace, what do you think about them now? You think it was worth it? Or should you have tried up with your, with your bros, with your sisters, and took care of business? Or were you too set on being covetous? You hated us so much, you'd rather risk being put in captivity by a real oppressor, right? <laughs> or are you still the real oppressor? They wanted our absolute annihilation. These suspicions were well-founded. The Spanish attempted at least three different extermination plans. Each failed. War with the Karakawas was a major detriment to the Spaniards. Primarily, it contributed to near collapse of a Spanish presence in Texas from 1780 to 1785. Five years without the hijack. <laughs> That's called paradise. It also devoured much needed manpower and left the citizens of Bahia paralyzed and unable to tend their cattle, their fields, Spanish was going through torment from these dragons. And when presidentials made their expeditions against the Karakawas, a lack of watercraft meant they could never follow the American Indians through the maze-like bay systems. So you had the flow of the water. They couldn't even follow you in these things to attack the Karakawa on their island. Often Spanish patrols would spot the coastal American Indians offshore in their canoes and shout at them to come to shore. And it's like, hey, man, come over here, man. And so they could properly enact their punishment. Yosef and other Karakawa chiefs further confounded the Spanish patrols by employing elaborate smoke signals and using information from native people living in La Bahia. So they had their own connection of Nagas and Espiritu Santa to learn troop movements. Moreover, the Karakawas traded their 
weaponry directly and indirectly to other Naga groups, indigenous groups opposing the Spaniards who bolstered the pressure on the Spanish elsewhere across Texas. So they kept that pressure on the neck bone of Hijack City. Shout out to the bro, Yosef. <laughs> Shout out to the car, Kawas. They kept that pressure on. Kind of like, um, you know, Star Wars, you got the rebellion, right? The rebellion got to keep the pressure on the hijack, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is the rebellion, Manaki. All you're hearing about is Nat Turner, but you got a bunch of Nat Turners that were successfully kicking, you know, butt time and time again with rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. But now we just call them. Chicamaga, Chicamaga War, Chicamaga War, Barbary War, you know, rebellion after rebellion after rebellion, the Kumse War, you know what I'm saying? Rebellion after rebellion after rebellion, Texas Indian Wars. And they officially are popping them off in 1844, but we're reading right here that <laughs> Yosef was popping it off way before then. He's popping off in 1770s and stuff, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? From 1782 to 8, 1786, hostilities, hostilities persisted. Stock continued to be stolen. Fear continued to entrance citizens of the corporation. And the Karakawas remained the dominant coastal power. And just, you know, I'll leave it late for you. We can dig on it more. You know what I mean? This is a great great read but just know that when all was said and done they said that he got killed by um some apaches <laughs> they didn't go into detail but they say uh so they had some peace talks you know they kept trying to have peace talks but you already know we weren't having that and they weren't you know, true to that anyway. So this peace was precariously achieved. One of the most foremost challenges to the peace talks came in December, 1789, when a rumor spread that the Spanish had captured Yosef and his son through treachery Now, I want to say this around the same time that Dragon Canoe died, you know what I mean? But, you know, look it up, you know what I mean? We're just talking to Cherokee, Cherokee, Karaka. Let's keep going. <laughs> we got some good drive, man. Hey, this is, hey, <laughs> Preston uh, 98, don't be late. <laughs> we popping up. So how did he die, Yosef? How did they say he died? A rumor spread that the little Spanish or that the Spanish had captured Yosef and his son through treachery, bound them and shot them to death because Sergeant Antonio Trevino happened to be in Yosef's father-in-law's settlement at the time. The rumor was squashed. Trevino explained that the Apaches or the Lapan Indians had killed Yosef and his son, not the Spaniards. Damn. So he was killed by indigenous cons. <laughs> he wasn't killed by the Spaniards. All that fighting the Spaniards to be killed by your own brothers. Didn't they say that they tried to set traps for him, tried to get his own people, other chiefs to assassinate him? And it looked like it finally happened through these Apaches or this sector of Apaches under the banner of Lapan Indians. They killed him and his bond. How, where, and why the Apaches killed Yosef and his son are unknown, my War between the Karakawas 
and the Spanish ended with the reestablishment of the Rosario's mission in 1789. So after he died in 1789, after making them abandon this mission, they set it right back up, reestablished it the year he died and founding the Nuestra Sonora del Refug Refugio Mission in 1793. Refugio. Refugio. So this city was founded on the back or the head bone of the death of Yosef and his bond. This city is Refugio County. This was the birthplace of baseball, great Nolan Ryan. Okay. <laughs> wow. Translates to shelter in Spanish because they needed it. However, there are at least three common pronunciations of this name. Referio, referio, referral, refurio, right, refugio. So there's a lot happening in Corpus Christi, Texas. Yeah, we know it's a big football town. <laughs> a lot of ball games being played. 1789 on the timeline in the middle of the Chickamauga War. While the slave trade is popping off, right? <laughs> Barbary, because they are enslaving the Swan Knights, because Barbar is Swan in Hebrew. Swan Knights are you. We're talking Sylvanus to Texas, and genealogy never connected. We're talking Toltecs, we're talking Texas, we're talking the Barbers being enslaved, pirate raids, <laughs> yeah. You can look up battle after battle after battle. And you're going to see yourself there. Okay, so Dragon Canoe died in night or 1792. Wow. <laughs> so they took out two prestors, man, two priest kings in a matter of three years. From 1789. 1992 this was a big a big time big losses for the shikama karaka karaka wa then the treaty of fort finity right around this time not involving us but people that wanted to you know, do these treaties on our behalf in the more on more war. And you got Fort Finity, you know, treaty selling a bunch of land right around this time. And you got the Fort, uh, Fort Wayne, 1809 treaty. So they say no major war because we're doing the treaty. We got 30 million acres of land in 1809. Tacoma said enough. <laughs> Y'all hijack better not step foot. Not one foot on this land. You hot damn better not step one damn foot on this land. Or else we going to war. He tribed them up, and that's what happened. And that's what kept happening. That's what kept happening. That's what kept happening. And now we're in now we're in Tol Texas. So they set up this mission right on his head bone in 17. 89. Yosef sparked the conflict more than a decade earlier and by uniting discordant Karakawa tribes asserted 
his control over the Spaniards. Although Yosef attacked the Spanish, he did not intend to rid them from the coastal plains, rather he wanted to continue using the Spanish as a resource. You don't know his doggone plans. Shut your ass. Trying to speak for the man. Let him speak for himself. Yeah, he had to use them as a resource. Shipwreck their ass. Take their bullets. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's war. It don't mean he wanted to hijack there forever. He didn't intend to rid of them. Then why is he... <laughs> why is he popping off, man? Just to show dominance. Oh, okay. The Guapai leader derived a portion of his power from his enemy. Yeah, he shipwrecked there. His familiarity with the Spaniards, customs and language gave him diplomatic and military edge, edge when compared to other Karakawa leaders and the Spaniards. This kind of reminds me of that Joseph Brandt too. You know, he was very pivotal uh, in popping off uh, the Chicamagua Wars. Tecumseh War, but he was also very diplomatic. You know, he was trying to find solutions on both sides, but, you know, at the end of the day, he was with his people, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, even Tecumseh was trying to meet with Harrison and them to at least discuss how this war was going to go down. Like, that's just traditional. You know, you're going to have a war with somebody, you have a sit down first, you know? So they didn't intend on doing no treaties. They trying to say that the treaties are or void, the treaties are fake. The treaties can't be real. Can't go in effect if all the tribes ain't down with them. If you're not including the Shawnee, you're not including, you know what I'm saying, the 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 uh the Creek and the Seminole, you're not inclu you're not including a lot of Nagas. You're just making treaties, giving up land, 30 million acres, 30 million in one treaty, 30 million. Imagine. I had 30 million joy worlds and I can give a joy world to every Naga. Imagine that dream of mine to give a joy world to every Naga, an acre of land to every Naga. You had it already. One treaty gave it away. Was it worth it? Delaware tribes, was it worth it? Miami, was it worth it? Lenape, was it worth it? Choctaw, was it worth it? Chickasaw, was it worth it? 30 million acres? No, I think if they can do it again, they would choose life over the hatred they got in their heart bone, over the covetous for the promised land. They at least could... You know, you, you would rather be a servant in the house of Hawa than be destroyed forever, be oppressed forever. In the house of Hawa, we, we don't oppress our servants. You know, we all serve in this house, you know what I'm saying? But with this hijack you got over you right now, you pay paying taxes, man. You know what I'm saying? You serve. You getting massacred. Our people are dying every day. Now check this out. Check this out, man. It's Preston 98. <laughs> Watch this, man. <laughs> Y'all ready to go there, man? <laughs> I brought you all through this story <laughs> to go right here to this point, right? <laughs> Y'all ready for this, man? I told you it gets better, man. We didn't even get started yet. We didn't even get started. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. And the Spanish inclined to cloak their worldview over other native peoples unknowingly reinforced Yosef's authority by treating him as the centralized leader for all the Karaka Awa. After Pedro Perez's disastrous death, because if you read back, it says that <laughs> these Nagas really weren't on no play play. You know what I'm saying? They tried to set up some peace talk sent this dude named Perez, man. <laughs> and it went all the way up, you know what I mean? They said the Karakawas, all right, so 1787, Angel Angelino mapping expedition on the Gulf Coast 
had gone according to plan, this altered when Yosef ordered his wife to accompany him back to San Antonio for the second round of peace talks with Martinez, Martinez Pacheco. She refused. Now, why did she refuse? Why did the Aqua refuse? That's, that's interesting. They're saying Yosef became angry. And that's all they tell you about that. Then they say the Karakawas became angry at Yosef with arguments escalating. So maybe they were angry that his wife wasn't gone or, you know, I don't know. With, a, with arguments escalating, the commanding officer of the Spanish soldiers, Pedro Perez, stepped in with his troops to calm down the situation, they say. This is their account. This ain't what actually happened. He ain't here to tell his side of the story. This is the hijacked side of the story. Perez comes in to calm down the situation. Then an intoxicated Karakawa <laughs> named Chapito. All right, so they already are slandering this dude, right? So this don't really sound like the truth already, but an intoxicated Karakawa named Chapito walked behind Pedro Perez and shot and killed him. So he got shot in the back of the head. <laughs> by a drunk Cherokee or a Karakawa. A skirmish between the Karakawas and Spanish ensued, resulting in two Karakas, Karakawas' death and the Spaniards fleeing to Bla Bahia. So that set off a bunch of stuff. That's their story, but just know that they came for peace dogs. We kept killing them, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then the Apaches killed yourself. After Pedro Perez's disastrous death, Yosef lost his influence and other Karakawa leaders. So he could have been set up, you know, like they tried all these schemes, right? They could have had somebody in his own camp act like they were just drunk, do some crazy stuff, and then say, see, he, he don't have control over his own people. You know what I mean? They could have set that whole situation up, man, knowing our people, how we be, you know what I mean? Just, just, just look at neighborhood nip, man. Let's go. <laughs> it's still happening today. Our own people, right? Our own people, right? Our own tribe, right? The story is repeating itself. So Yosef, they say, lost his influence and other Kar and Kawa leaders, such as Chief Balt Baltazar. Whoa, <laughs> where did this come from, right? <laughs> All right, so enter into the story, Chief Balthazar. <laughs> with a name like Balthazar, you got to dig on it. Where, what's going on with this? He's a Karakawa, right? He's a Naga. He's a Naga. But they have him as the one that came in, stepped into this, you know, situation after Yosef's death. He steps into position, into the position created by Yosef, which is the Khan of Khans, right? He was, he was the Khan of the, of the Karakawa. So now Balthazar steps up as the Khan to win peace with the Spaniards. So he don't go to war with them like Yosef did. He goes for peace. <laughs> he does treaties. And because of this peace, they venerate they venerate Balthazar. He becomes a saint to the Spanish Catholics. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, boss. <laughs> Got him. We popping up. 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 We pop it. Uh, uh, we pop it. Got him. <laughs> it could be something. It could be nothing, man. But three wise men or magi, right? Now we're back to the Presta flow because he's considered one of these magi and he's 
depicted in the New Testament as an Ethiopian that's paying obeisance to baby Jesus, right? He's one of the Magi, the Ethiopian, but you're not linking him to being the King of Kings, Rex Nagus, Preston John, right? And you're not linking this JC, baby Jesus, to Joshua or Kitsukwadu. Then you say, whoa, was, you know, Preston, <laughs> you know, there when Joshua was born, Moses's possibly nephew, you know, Joshua could be, you know, Miriam's son, according to the Quran, they have this teaching, you know, some do, you know, that Mary and Jesus is Miriam and Joshua, reflections, duplications, and this baby Jesus that got the prester there, that got the star of Bethlehem and the shooting star, just like the Kum say, this dragon in the sky, this prester's there, this meteor's there. Because Joshua is the rainbow dragon, <laughs> you know what I mean? So three wise men or magi from the east are described in the gospels as having seen a new star, dragon, star with a tail, and journey to pay tribute to the child marked as divine, by the heavens because they came because they saw the dragon the wise men were often depicted as kings priest king right and by the renaissance the youngest was frequently depicted as an african depicted as an african really we're talking the new testament <laughs> okay so we're we talking african are we talking a copper color con now let's go here holding a gold vessel containing a mirth containing mirth a precious resin from arabia we're gonna talk arab we're gonna talk we're gonna talk arab <laughs> and africa used for perfume so where's africa we're in northwest africa right according to a maxim. His portrayal reflects both the ethnic diversity encountered by Renaissance painters in a port like Venice, frequented by Moors, right? <laughs> African traders, and also the concept of Christ's promise of salvation for all his people. The splendor of the king contrasts with the simplicity of the holy family, chubby little angels sing the words inscribed on the scroll. <laughs> Glory to God in heaven, peace to man on earth accompanied by others playing flutes and violin. Right, we're talking Balthazar. Saint Balthazar, or Chief Balthazar. We popping off. Y'all popping off, man. And hey, we still got the fire burning? Okay, okay. Just checking, gotta make sure. Still got the fire burning. Chief Balthazar steps into the position as a Khan that was created by Yosef, gathering the tribes. He goes for peace with the hijack, though. And perhaps this is why they venerate Saint Balthazar Magus. Why he's paying homage to baby JC in the Roman Catholic Church. Now they, I mean, they put this story in different places, you know, you know, timelines is crazy, right? Now, Balthazar is also a character in the 1880 novel, <laughs> which is happening around the same, you know, 17, 1800s of this Balthazar, spelled exactly the same. Could be something, could be nothing. We're investigating, monogas. we're investigating. Follow the star of Bethlehem. Phantoms and duplications. I mean, you 
tell me my knives. <laughs> we popping off. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, President John, you know, he's a Marvel character. <laughs> I'm gonna go from uh, <laughs> Belthazar to Preston John, official handbook of the Marvel Universe, Master Edition number 24. Shout out to Keith Pollard and Joe Rubenstein. All right. So, you know, initially they were trying to see how they're going to make the Preston look. <laughs> Super duper negoos. They didn't turn him into a Caucasian yet, but you know, you know, that's just how they were starting off, you know. Then you got the modern version. <laughs> now he's a Caucasian, but he got this this scepter though, this rod. Now he got dragon armor, like dragon scales going on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Prester John. <sighs> they want to put their faces on everything. Prester John, alias Wanderer. <laughs> okay. Dual identity, none. He's just the Prester. Prester John's existence is not known to the general populace of present day Earth except as a legendary character. Don't that sound just like us? But this is a Marvel biographical description. He's an explorer, a traveler. <laughs> He's a priest and a king. <laughs> okay. It's a major enemies, Prince John or Chandu the Mystic. Man, that sound like Genghis, man. That sound like Genghis Khan. Man. They got him at 6'1, 210 pounds, man. Oh, man. Here we go. They want to put blue eyes on him, blonde hair on <laughs> Khan, Khan. We just popping up. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. Let's go. I will also appoint him firstborn. I'm just talking press to John. Highest of the kings of the earth. I'm just talking press to John. Because the covenant has been sworn unto David. Forever I will establish your seed and build up your throne to all nations. Managa, you are the firstborn. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil. Oh, have I anointed him? Not you. He's my anointed. I don't care what you're saying. You can't twist the story up. My hand shall establish him. My arm shall strengthen him. And the enemy can't even mess with him, man. Nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat to pieces his adversaries and smite them that Hate on him. Hate on Dawi. But don't trip, I know I know we've been out of cold for a long time, but Hawa's faithfulness and Hawa's mercy, my mercy shall be with him. And through my name shall his horn be exalted. Not David's name, Hawa's name. You know, like uh Kara. What is Hawa? What is Hawa? Love to my Aqua Tracy Lay. I'm still in that Presta pack. <laughs> I'm 
I'm still in that, uh, you know, these are links. A lot are on the press to pack already. You know, she recalibrated them, man. Yeah, she added a lot of great links and, you know, things that we had covered, PDF them, man. And I'm going to call them the, the drop PDFs, man. Tracy's drop PDF. But uh, it's amazing. And I'm in it right now. These links that uh, we pulled up before. This is a good one though I want to start with, man. Let me actually let's see. I mean. Aqua Tracy Lay, you got the drop. <laughs> you got the drop. I am that I am. Kawhi told Moshe to tell. You Nagas, I exist. They said, you know, he said, who, what should I tell them to call you? You know what I mean? What, what frequency should they call on? They gonna say who sent me. Hawa oh, said, I exist. Tell them I exist, man. I am. I am that I am is a common English translation of the Hebrew phrase. A, 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 right? We keep getting that. Aya Ashir A. That's what they translated it. So you got to go further because you know Hawa's name ain't going to be in Wikipedia. I mean, you got to know Hawa's name will not be in Wikipedia. I mean, you know, not when you're looking up, looking for it. <laughs> they might sneak it in with the HUA or something, but they're not going to put it in Wiki, man. You're going to have to go further. You have to go further. If you want to know, if you don't care, you don't care. But if you want to know, you got to go further. But look how easy it is to go further. I am who I am. I will become what I choose to become. I am what I am to be, to be established, to become. What is that in Hebrew? How do you say that in Hebrew? I will be what I will be. I create whatever I create. What should we call you? Tell them I'm the creator. I create. I am the existing one. We're going to talk existing. Because you can't keep seeing H-U-A, Hawa, everywhere and not know what it means. So what does Hawa mean in the Kara Khan Hawa people? Existing, the traditional English translation within Judaism favors I will be what I will be because there is no present tense of the firm to be in the Hebrew language. I like I create <laughs> whatever I create too. I mean, hey, I like create because when they talk Hawa or hey, I am to exist, to be. That is also I create. So you, you got, I am the creator. <laughs> I exist, the creator. We're talking the existing one. Aya, I share Aya. And the first of the three responses given to Moses when he asked for Hawa's name in the book of Exodus. Aya is the first person form of Heya, Ka, love to the Brolex. We have to know Hawa's name ain't going to be in no Wikipedia, man. You got to go further. If you don't know this by now, it's pride and ego holding you back. It's covetous holding you back. And you can't be a cold keeper with a covetous heart. You got to let that go. Empty your cup and get that water, get that mem flow. So when they say Aya, it is Hey, 
right? To be, I am, I was, I will be. How easy is this to continue, my naga? So to know that I am that I am, or I create <laughs> what I create is higher than what's higher. Yeah, we know the Indians sounding like, you know, hey, yeah, uh, hey, yeah, uh, hey, uh, on all the modern Indians, right? But the OG Nagas of India Superior were saying, how, 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 What is hey? We got to know. I mean, we need to know. Hey. Strong's concordance this number H1961. Love to the Rolex, man. Hey, but you see this W here? Don't ignore it. Don't ignore this W phonetically. Because that hall makes all the difference in your wah. Don't skip over this hall because you want your yah. Don't skip over the hall for the y'all. <laughs> What is hey, right? A beacon all together be. You see that X right there, man? Because two cross sticks come together to exist. These tribes exist through Hawa. We are accomplished. Hawa has come. Hawa has committed. Come to pass, continue. Managa, we are talking to exist, we pop it now. So if hey us to exist, how did it get to Yahweh? 1869, hypothetical reconstruction of the Tetragrammaton based on the assumption that the Tetragrammaton is the imperfect, non-perfect, of the Hebrew verb Hawa. So they imperfected the Hawa perfection. It's based on the assumption that the tetragrammaton, your Yod, Hey, Wa, Hey, Wa, Hey, Wa, Ha, Ya, Yo, or Ya, Ha, Wa, right? <laughs> Is the imperfected mana of the Hebrew verb Hawa, which is the earlier form of Heya. Body back. You gotta go further, my nigga. That's why we popping up. We popping up. We popping up. So, yeah, up to all the scholars that, you know, Hawa puts in place to give us the bits, the pieces, to get the babies out the bath water, but we gonna continue and drop nation. When we call on the creator, when we call on existence i am that i am exodus what is it? exodus three you know what i'm saying i am that i am i will be what i will be i will be who i will be i create what i create who i create i shall prove to be whatsoever i shall prove to be <laughs> i am the existent one man we just talking existence <laughs> existing huh it's easy right because hawa is the earlier form of heya heya means to exist and hawa which is the earlier form of heya was or in the sense the one who is the existing we popping up yeah so whether we're talking about I am that I am existing, I am the existing one is literally Hawa, which is the one who is existing, which is the earlier form of Heya. So they went from Eya to Heya, or they went from Hawa to Heya to Eya, Ashir Eya. <laughs> and you know, Hawa's name ain't gonna be in no wiki, man. Hawa's name ain't gonna be in wiki, man. So if they're giving you 
hey, uh, you got to go further to the one who is the existing Hawa. And then you got to go further to the Picto Paleo and know that when you get that strong power in you, your house, and you start to gather that gong, and you walk through that door, that entrance, that dog, and you get that breath, <sighs> breath, <sighs> ah, aha, I have a revelation. I, wa I walked through a door with my family, my tribe. I got that strong power. I got that breath. You get that wah. You get that added security, man. You get that hook. You get that foundation. You keep in the cold. You got a hawa. You got the breath of security. And you got that secure breath. Hawa is hawa, which they call heya or ashir or, you know, aya, ashir aya which was Heya, which was earlier Hawa, which is the fifth and sixth letter in the Picto Paleo Hebrew, my nother, the Ebaru, with no Yah in front of it. You went through the door and got Hawa. You didn't go through the door together with your family, your tribe, led by your strong power. Your strong power didn't lead you, your tribe through the door didn't gather you, tribe you up, to bring you through the door, to give you ya, you got, ah, wah. Then you got your Zion, Mount Zion. You got your Dawi, Hosea 3, search for Hawa and Khan Dawi, because Mount Zion has one shepherd. Mount Zion, Zion will cut you off. That's how we eat. That's how we get our food. We got to cut off the hijack. That's how we get nourished. If you don't have your yah before your food, your nourishment, you're on that play play. Because the actual Hebrew yah has everything to do with work, right? <laughs> Worshiping who? The creator didn't say, I am worshiped. <laughs> no, you know to worship the existence. The one who is the existing one should be automatic because you got your revelation. <laughs> and now you got your foundation. Hawa. That's how easy it is to continue. All you got to do is look it up. I am that I am. Say, what's the creator's name? Oh, I am that I am. What are they calling it? Oh, it's the singular imperfective form of Heya, which is the imperfective form of Hawa, which is the fifth and the sixth Pictopaleo Ibaru letter, meaning a secure breath, a breath in security, a breath of security, which is your framer and your shaper, your Ama Abba, because when you breathe, <gasps> You first got to inhale. That inhale is your ama. That's the feminine. The masculine is the exhale. Wow. They say the dragon sound like he's saying wow when he's burning you down. They say wall. I say wow. The dragon sound like he's saying wall. While he's giving you that added security so you can have a foundation. So you ain't, you know, Anything other than firm, fixed, and immovable out here, man. Now we can eat together, cut off this hijack, and be nourished. Then we can start building our wall, <laughs> our tent wall for Joy World. Who's going to be surrounded in it? Who's going to be contained, contained? Who's going to help us build it up from the mud so we can worship blue, purple, red, our creator? and throw away this hijack and put that work in <laughs> with our hand bones, man. <laughs> Ooh, and it keeps going, right?
this this story tells our story and we gotta see that the code is already here for us to keep already locked in for us to keep man hey allow why we popping up we popping up we popping up yeah we found you my queen you in algiers you in louisiana yeah okay So let's get it from here as we start to near our dismount, you know, start to think about making a dismount. <laughs> I mean, we done talked about the car and car, wah. Then they get this chief Belteshazzar after Joseph dies. Belteshazzar ends up being this, this saint, you know what I'm saying, with this three magi flow. Man. Hawa said, my name shall his horn be exalted. I said, what's his name? <laughs> Allah, Hawa, we popping off. Second address, chapter six, verse 55. We're gonna get some more of this address. I love this address, man. All this I have spoken before you, Hawa because you made the world for our sakes. As for other people, which also come from Adam, you have said that they are nothing. Hawa, you said they ain't nothing, man, compared to your treasure ones. They are like unto spittle and has likened the abundance of them like a drop that falls from a vessel. And now, Hawa, behold, these hijacks, these heathen, which have ever been reputed as nothing, have begun to be lords over us. Now they got something. And now they've begun to devour us. They're making treaties on us, man. But we, your people, whom you have called your firstborn, you're only begotten. So there Christ replaced the entire nation of Israel because we are, we are the firstborn. Even David is called the firstborn. We're going to get the Targum translations because they go in on these Psalms and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be mind blasting. Remember we talked about Psalm 74. They got a whole nother translation of Psalm 74 with this Leviathan flow, man. Remember about the, the Leviathan meat uh, to the righteous in the wilderness? They got a whole nother translation <laughs> in the Targum script of Psalm 74. Ain't even got much to do with, I mean, all right, we're going to talk about it. Let's go for the dismount. But we, your people, whom you called your firstborn, your only begotten, your fervent love, who are given into their hands, man. If the world now be made for our sakes, why do we not possess an inheritance? Man, what happened to our land? Oh, treaties. How long shall this endure? So this Targum flow, Aramaic, you know, originally spoken translation of the Hebrew Bible, they say that a reader or a professional uh, translator would give in the common language of the listeners when he was not Hebrew. This had become necessary near the end of the first century as the common language was aromatic, Aramaic, and Hebrew was used for little more than schooling and worship. The translator frequently expanded his translation with paraphrases, explanations, and examples, so it became a kind of sermon. Writing down the Targum was initially prohibited. Nevertheless, some Targumic writings appeared as early as the middle of the first century. So 
Oh no, at first they were not recognized as authoritative <laughs> by the hijack. Some subsequent Jewish traditions beginning with the Babylonian Jews, back to Babylonian captivity, exile, exile, exilarchs, right? Let's get it. Accepted the written Targun, Targunim as authoritative translations of the Hebrew scriptures into Aramaic. So some Jewish traditions accepted the Targa. Right. Today, the common meaning of Targum is a written Aramaic translation of the Bible. Only Yemenite, remember Yemen? Yemen, the son of, or he's, he's one of the ancestors of Joktan or something, right? So they continue to use the Targum liturgic, litur, liturgically. All right, all right, let's go. So it's a cool link. I'll leave it off for you. You can get different uh, Psalms translations with it. Let's just, let's, you know, bounce around and see the difference in the Targum. Now, again, it could be something, could be nothing. I can't say they're accurate. Maybe they're just giving you another interpretation of what's going on, you know, with certain things. But we got a lot out this Targum, especially with the Psalms 110 drop. Uh, my Lord said to your Lord, they want to say, Oh, uh, David's calling Jesus Lord. Nah, he says, my master. <laughs> my master. My man, got I got to get <laughs> Instead of saying, oh, the Lord said to my Lord, it says, Hawah said in his degree to make me Lord of all Israel. <laughs> now, you know, we're talking David and not no JC. Hawah said in his degree to make me Lord of all Israel. But he said to me, wait still for Saul of the tribe of Benjamin to die. For one reign must not encroach on another. And afterwards, I will make your enemies a prop for your feet. How many times? As he's told David, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. He just said in Psalms 89, I'm going to smash your enemies to pieces, man. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking Dawi. But the Christian uses this and the Christian light uses this to explain how their Yahweh Shai, how their Christ is worshipped by David. It says, my Lord said to your, your Lord said to my Lord. <laughs> So your Lord is, is this, and my Lord is, <laughs> come on, man. Wait still for Saul of the tribe of Benjamin to die for one reign must not encroach on another. And afterwards, I will make your enemies a prop for your feet. Hawah said by his decree to give me the dominion in exchange for sitting and study of Torah. Wait at my right hand until I make your enemies a prop for your feet. Hawah said in his decree to appoint me ruler over Israel. But Hawah said to me, wait for Saul of the tribe of Benjamin to pass away from the world. And afterwards, you will inherit kingship and I will make your enemies a prop for your feet. These are three different translations of Psalms 118 and none of them got nothing to do with Jesus. Christians. Let's go. Psalms 18. Now we read this a lot, right? With, you know, smoke coming out his nostrils, you know, fire out of his mouth. But instead of, you know, I don't know if they're trying to hide the dragon <laughs> or are they trying to give another interpretation of who the dragon is, is uh, smiting. But let's read a piece of this. Verse seven, when I am in distress, I pray in the presence of Hawaii and in the presence of my power, I make supplication. And he accepts my prayer from his temple and my petition is his, in his presence is received by his ears and is granted. This is David popping up. Hawa trembled and shook and the foundations of the mountains tottered and split or he was angry with it. Now, instead of saying smoke went up from his nostrils, it says 
the arrogance of Pharaoh went up like smoke, my God. Whoa. <laughs> Come on, man. Now, this don't mean that smoke didn't go up from his nostrils, but it's giving you another perspective of this smoke and that who got the smoke was Pharaoh. Now, why would they hide this Pharaoh situation? We're talking David. How can we talk? How can we be talking David and Pharaoh at the same time? When I think of Pharaoh, I think of Egypt. I don't know about you. It says Pharaoh, the wicked. So you know, maybe they're just saying wicked in general and calling all the wicked Pharaoh. But they're speaking of specific Pharaoh. They say the arrogance of Pharaoh went up like smoke. Then he sent his anger like a burning fire that consumes before him. His rebuke burns at his utterance like coals of fire. And he bent down the heavens and his glory was manifested, a dark cloud, a path before him. So he was manifested in his strength over swift cherubs. And he proceeded in might on the wings of the storm wind. So instead of flying on the wings of the wind, it says he manifested in his strength over swift cherubs. Now he just hopped on a chair. <laughs> he manifested in his strength and he proceeded in might on the wings of the storm wind. And he made his presence dwell in the mist and surrounded himself with the clouds of his glory as a covering. And he made favorable rains to fall on his people and mighty waters from the massed clouds of darkness on the wicked from the eternal heights. Awa gave a shout from heaven. The Most High raised up his utterance. He cast hell and coals of fire. His, he sent his words like arrows. <laughs> his word like arrows. And scattered them. He sent many lightning bolts and confounded them. And the depths of the sea became visible. <laughs> and the pillars of the world were uncovered. Oh, I thought you were spinning on a ball. You don't have no pillars. A spinning ball ain't got no foundation. But Hawa said that we were firm fixed. The foundation was fixed, fastened, still, my God, firm, fixed, immovable. The pillars of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of Hawa from the utterance of your mighty wrath. So instead of smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth, like the dragon flow, they're talking specifically about Pharaoh going up like smoke, which could still be talking dragon flow, <laughs> burning down the Pharaoh. And what does that got to do with David? And what has David got to do with Moses? Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh, boss. Uh-oh, boss. It sounds very Moshe-ish, right? We done talked before about the possibility of both of these characters, you know, being parts of each other, Moses and David being parts of each other. You know what I'm saying? It's possible that uh, Prester John is a combination of David and Moses. Got all these powers like Moshe, like this high level uh, uh, Merlin, you know, Merlin is also a take on Moses, you know, so, Moses is Moshe, you know, all these are titles, right? Uh, Dawood is a title. So these are titles for these mighty knights. Now, Psalm 74, right? Because, <laughs> oh man, oh yeah, we just got Psalm 89 too. Yeah, I mean, we're doing a lot of comparisons right now. Yeah, I mean, just right quick, Psalms 89, man, it's the Torah conversion of just the opening of that. Um, I will praise the kindness. 
this is a good lesson uttered by Abraham who came from the east. Uttered by Abraham that comes from the east. Okay, let's go. I will praise the kindness of Hawa forever from generation to generation. I will make known your truth from my mouth. For I said, the world will be built by kindness. You will establish your truth in the heavens. I will make a covenant with Abraham, my chosen. I confirmed it with my servant, David. Whoa. <laughs> we are popping off, man. So this covenant Hawa established with David is the same covenant with Abraham. but it's confirmed through David. So anyone claiming Abraham, the promise of Abraham, Ishmaelites, and whoever wants to claim Abraham, even Lot wants to claim Abraham, and Lot ain't even the seed of Abraham. <laughs> He's the nephew of Abraham. That's Abraham's brother's bond. Still Baruch, they were still giving blessings, right? But they're not within this confirmation of the inheritance the heritage the royal throne is established confirmed through Dawi. i will establish your sons forever and for every generation i will build your royal throne forever So in the Tanakh 1917, it says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. It, it ain't talking about Abraham here, right? I mean, it is, but they don't say it. You know what I'm saying? But we know we're talking us. We're talking Abraham. We're talking Isaac. I have sworn unto David, my servant. I have confirmed it, right? I will establish your seed and build up your throne to all generations. Forever, Managa, forever. And the heavens will confess your wonders a while, also your truth in the assembly of the Holy One. I will not violate my covenant. And the utterance of my lips, I will not change. This forever talk is forever, Managa, with David. Once I have sworn, by my holy name, Hawah, I will not lie to David. His sons will exist forever. And his throne is bright as the sun before me. His Targum got to drop. And I will make him firstborn of the kings of the house of Judah. Let's be specific now. So just as Edris, <laughs> just as Edris just brought out that Hawa, whom has called thy firstborn, we, your people, whom you called your firstborn, we, we are the firstborn. In 89, in the Tanakh, it calls Dawi. He says, hey, you shall call me father. Thou art my father, rock of my salvation, and I will appoint him firstborn. The highest of the kings of the earth, we're talking to Preston. Here it says, I will make him firstborn, specifically, <laughs> firstborn of the kings of the house of Judah, the highest of the kings of the earth. <laughs> so whoever holds the scepter out the house of Judah is the highest of the kings on the earth plain, period. And there ain't no play play. And we popping off. We popping off.
I will preserve my goodness to him forever. And my covenant is constant for him. I will set up his sons and daughters forever in his throne for as many days as the heavens will last. Let's go. The goat. So when we talk Psalm 74, just like we read Psalms 18, it's like, <laughs> you know, they, they brought the Pharaoh into it. The arrogance of Pharaoh went up like smoke. Let's, let's read Psalms 74. <laughs> and I'm just surfing the wave looking for, um, you know, how they be saying, um, you know, how we was talking last time, man, about this Leviathan, right? Thou didst break the sea in pieces by thy strength. Thou didst shatter the heads of the sea monsters in the water. Thou didst crush the heads of Leviathan. Thou gave him to be food to the folk <laughs> inhabiting the wilderness. So, you know, if we're just looking at this, you know, food to the people in the wilderness, well, we know we're talking Hawaii's people, back to the manna flow, but here's another way to look at it. <laughs> here's a completely different way to look at it. We're just talking Psalm 74. Yeah. Some even say, uh, you crushed the heads of Leviathan, you fed them to the creatures of the desert. It went from the people in the wilderness to the creatures. And I said, whoa, why are they saying creatures? You go from folk in the wilderness to creatures in the desert. And what food are we talking about? Some say meat, right? Some translations say meat. <laughs> hey, Hawa said all the borders. We're talking the boundaries of the earth, man. Talking to earth ponds, huh? <laughs> Targum, <laughs> what is you saying about this Psalm 74? Let's go right to it. But Hawa is the king whose holy presence is from of old, verse 12. One who carries out redemption in the midst of the land. You cut off the waters of the sea by your power. You broke the heads of sea serpents. It don't even say Leviathan. It just says sea serpents. And drowned the Egyptians at the sea. Back to this Pharaoh talk. You shattered the heads of Pharaoh's warriors. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Here it says you shatter the heads. You crush, you know, you shattered the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. And the tar gum, it reads. You shattered the heads of Pharaoh's warriors. First it said you broke the heads of the sea serpents, drowned the Egyptians at the sea, shattered the heads of Pharaoh's warriors. You handed them over for destruction to the people of the house of Israel. Whoa. <laughs> so instead of you getting Leviathan meat, food, right? It was the people, according to the Targum, the warriors that got handed over for destruction to the house of Israel, which is why I said, why did they suddenly start calling them, first of all, folk inhabiting the wilderness when the righteous are in the wilderness and we're looking for this righteous, you know, flow. Then they start calling us creatures in the desert. And I said, that seemed like a slap in the face. Now we know they're talking about the tribe of Israel, but what we're being fed <laughs> is Pharaoh's warriors for destruction, not that we're eating them, but we're literally being, they're being devoured or destroyed by us because Hawaii is handing over Pharaoh's warriors, according to the Targon. He's handing over Pharaoh's warriors to the folk, right? 
the folk, the creatures, which are the people of the house of Israel for the dismount. We pop in, we pop in. Press the John installment number 98, my naga, road to 100. So instead of Leviathan <laughs> being crushed, the heads of Leviathan are the heads of the Pharaoh. His people are being fed so they may be devoured in war by the tribe of Israel in the wilderness. The creatures, the folk inhabiting the wilderness are the people of Israel. And we didn't eat their corpses because their corpses were tossed to the jackals. That's how their corpses were devoured. But Hawa shattered the heads of Leviathan, uh, Pharaoh's warriors. You handed them over for destruction to the people of the house of Israel and their corpses to jackals. Wow. What a dis what a difference a translation makes, man. So are we talking about Leviathan being crushed and fed as food? Or are the Pharaoh's warriors being called uh more sea serpents? <laughs> the heads of Leviathan. Maybe they were trying to conjure up Leviathan then, you know, they were just called the head to Leviathan. <laughs> they were fed to the creatures. Nah, they were fed to the tribe of Israel, the people of the house of Israel, but their corpses were fed to the jackals. They were destroyed. As all this is saying is that they were destroyed. You split the spring from the rock and it became a stream. That primary man from the primary rock, Yosef, we out of here. You dried up the ford of the streams of Arna. Whoa. Whoa. Now we back on the Arna flow. We're talking about fords again. <laughs> oh, man. It's all happening now. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> we pop in now. We're gonna do our dismount, you know, back to this. Oh yeah, yeah, Yemen, huh? Yeah, yeah. Katan is the first king of Yemen. If they were talking Yemen nights. I knew it connected with Katan, which is Joktan, which is the son of Eber. We still got to talk Ofer, Sheba, Shambhala, right? Havala. Okay. I'm just seeing what we got. <laughs> what we got popping off in 99, man. Going back in there on Shambhala flow. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. We got some more, uh, more, more Shambhala flow, rainbow dragon flow. Okay. Where's that Antion flow at? Oh yeah, we just talking about the Preston. <laughs> we just talking Preston John, don't mind us. Okay, okay. 
It's just reminding me when they say the four, reminding me of this drop on this forward business. What they just say? Let me get that again. You shattered the heads of Pharaoh's warriors. You handed them over for destruction to the people of the house of Israel and their corpses to jackals. You split the spring from the rock and it became a stream. You dried up the ford of the streams of the Arna and the ford of Jabbok and the Jordan were so powerful. Why does it say Arna here? <laughs> what does it say over here? <clears throat> a ford, shallow. Crossing place. This is from BibleOdyssey.com. Marsh, river, or stream where firm footing is available until Roman occupiers built the first bridges in Palestine. All crossings of water were by boat or through available fords. Such ford crossing points mentioned in biblical stories include one on the Jabbok, an eastern tributary to the Jordan or Yardin crossed by Jacob and his family. There were also fords on the Jordan itself, crossed by various groups, fords of the wilderness, the ford of Anion. Whoa, it didn't say Arnon, did it? It didn't say Arnon, did it? We caught him slipping, boss. More proof they changed all the Anions to mother sucking Arnons. <laughs> They've been changing the Anions to Arnons in real time. Get Preston John number 41. Because this Arnon Anion has everything to do in the connection to the Jordan. Forge leading to Babylon, presumably through the Euphrates, Dead Sea. We're talking Utah, Great Salt. Man, we, we just, we popping up. <laughs> we popping up. <laughs> we popping up. Ania, say it with me, not Ania. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So they say for the Ania. This one says you dried up the ford of the streams of Arna. Oh boy. The ford of Jabak and the Jordan. Same place, right? The same ford. The ford of Anion, eastern river draining into the Dead Sea. We're talking about Jabak. Jordan. Anya. But here is the ford of the streams of Arna. For the dismount, my nugget. For the dismount. Yeah, they crushed the heads of the pharaohs. And later these jabronis say they crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave him to be food to the folk inhabiting the wilderness. I mean, it could all be happening. We don't know. We investigate. <laughs> and we pop it off. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one got three Targum translations in Psalm 76 from the Telehim. Tovi, Tovia, and Sonmore. Right? <laughs> Recon the difference. Just looking at that creature thing, that you gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You broke open the springs and torrents. You shattered the heads of Pharaoh's warriors. You handed them over for destruction to the people of the house of Israel, my <laughs> and get and their corpses to jackals. There's a big difference. Uh-oh, thou did break to pieces the heads of the dragon. Whoa, they didn't even say Leviathan. They said the dragon. Thou did give him for meat. <laughs> Listen to this, man. <laughs> Not food, meat to the Ethiopian nations, man. Whoa, say it with me. Body bag for the illusion. So who's the Ethiopians? Anything to do with Africa over there or everything to do with Africa over here? <clears throat> Shalot, we're talking about the Abyssinians, right? I'm talking about I'll be seeing you. 
Abyssinia. Old name for Ethiopia. So before they make Ethiopia a certain place, just like Rudolph Sanders says in Lost Tries and Promise, Promised Lands, Ethiopia is a generic title, generic Ethiopes, burnt, Greek, Greek word meaning burnt, my knock, burnt faced people, originally from the Arabic Habasa. Habasa is the original Ethiopia, which became Abyssinia in the Latin. The name for the region said to be from Amaric, meaning mixed, like the mixed multitude of Mos Moshe, meaning different races dwelling there, different tribes. Abyssinia, I'll be seeing you. Abyssinia. Ethiopia. So to crush the heads of the dragons or Pharaoh's army and give him, give them as food or meat or over for destruction to the people of the house of Israel means that the Ethiopian nations are the house of Israel or that the house of Israel will be concluded in the Abyssinian mixed multitude Ethiopian nation body bag for the illusion. Body bag for the illusion. Let's go. We're having too much fun popping off. Monogam press John 98, man. Aqua, we got you. <laughs> My aqua popping off in Algier, which is over here. <laughs> we got you. It's just so cool that we know Algier is over here, Aqua. Alahua, that we can find you in Louisiana. <laughs> you know, man, um, talking about this Arab, you know, we talked about the Joktan flow before, the Joktan, Katan, ancestor of several Southern Arabian tribes. Arab genealogists hold Katan which is Joktan, son of Eber, father of Ofer, Sheba, Shambhala, Havala. He's the first king of Yemen, which is the Yucatan, Yaktan, Yucatan. And his son and successor, Yarub, the first person who spoke Arabic, came from the loins of Eber, Eberu, or Kavera, or Eber, Eber. This is but the legendary form of the, of the tradition that Katan was the progenitor of the Southern Arabs or Arab proper. So who's the proper Arabs? Let's see about it. Let's talk about it for the dismount. While the Ishmaelite Arabs were originally from non-Arab stock, what does it mean? They're both from Abraham. How come they're not both Arab stock? Because an Arab <laughs> is an A, is a rabbi. <laughs> a rabbi is an Arab. Right. So you got to be a Khan Baruch from Hawaii and Cole to be a true proper Arab. They took the customs of the, of the code keepers intermarried with genuine Arabs of the stock of Joktan, being therefore called Mustarabs. <laughs> Sound like musty, man. Musty rabs, man. <laughs> Mustarabs, Mustarabs. Another son of Joktan was called Gurhum, immigrating to Northwest Arabia, founding the kingdom of Hajaz or Hajaz or Hajaz. <laughs> that J ain't, ain't true, so we might just be talking about Hawaz. <laughs> but we just know that this Arab propers and there's pretending Arabs, man. The Ishmaelites migrating. These other tribes that are claiming to be Arabs are not proper Arabs. How do we know? How do we know? 
Let's get some confirmation. Aqua, let's get some confirmation. Like I said, Arab is a rabbi. <laughs> I don't know about this story here, but I'm just looking at Arab and his rabbi, right? <laughs> just, just looking at the correlation of the letters. Rabbi means teacher, master in Judaism or Hebrew. Rabbi. Remember the resh in Hebrew, the resh is the head, right? So the resh is the head of a man. Rosh, head first, top, beginning. So their rabbi is coming from this beginning, this, this, this top, this first, this head of a man. When we breaking it down and picked up <laughs> a rabbi, right? You got the ba, so the house, so it's the head of the house or the master, because the ba in Hebrew is the house or the bat, bat, ba, family house, the head of the family, the head of the man of the, the, the head of the family, you know what I'm saying? Head, the first, the top, got it, the master, right? Who's the master, the rabbi, or the Arab? Right, <laughs> we're taking it all back, taking all this back. Let's go quickly here, man. Rabbi, <laughs> this is a funny article from, Israelforever.org, the Arabs are our cousins, not the Muslims. <laughs> All right, so let's just get to it. Ishmael was not a Muslim, he was an Arab, but we know now that Ishmael was not a proper Arab. Ishmael were originally of non Arab stock. They adopted Arab customs, intermarried with genuine Arabs or the Arab proper of Eber. In Israel, Jews often call Arabs cousin, and that is because as Arabs, they are our cousins. They are not our cousins by virtue of them being Muslims, because that's a new faith or the Mohammedan traditions, you know what I'm saying? We do not call Malaysians or Pakistanis cousins because while they are Muslim, they are not Arabs. In short, we do not call any of the Muslims who are not Arab cousins. And we would call any Arab, regardless of his or her religious affiliation cousin, it's just that simple, okay. While Muslims around the world may consider Abraham as their spiritual father, they keep claiming Abraham, right? That does not make them offspring of Abraham because Lot is not an offspring of Abraham, the father of Isaac and Ishmael. But Ishmael is not an Arab proper. There were no Muslims in biblical times. I feel I need to repeat that in case it is not quite clear. There were no Muslims in biblical times. Body bag for the illusion. Ishmael was not a Muslim, man. No. Therefore, the Ishmael that reconciled with Isaac and stood beside him at the grave of their father, he was not a Muslim. It is a belief in Islam that any land they ever control must remain Muslim land forever. They want everything for Ham and Kush, regardless of who was there before and who managed to fight back and regain sovereignty afterwards. Likewise, they claim ownership over people from before Muhammad ever walked the earth. They retroactively claim Ishmael as a Muslim. Islam is their faith and they can define it however they want. They can make it out to have been Ishmael that was about to be sacrificed rather than Isaac. And that's what they say. Oh, Ishmael was the one that, that Abraham was going to sacrifice. Ishmael's the one that got the blessing, right? 
Yeah. We're talking about the most arrives, man. <laughs> the must arrives, man. Are the ancient Arab speaking Jews? Now, that's interesting. But we're just talking about seeds of Joktan and Hebrew. And the most arrives over there, it said that they are. In a Jewish encyclopedia, the most arabs. It said they're formed through this intermarrying with genuine Arabs. They're mixed in through the mother, through the maternal line. Wiki just calls them Arab speaking Jews. <laughs> okay. Largely Mitzrahi Jews and Mitzrahi Rabi Jews who lived in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so the Moors would be Mustarabs. Okay, got you. They're not Arabs. They're Musta, a rabbi or a rabbi. Hey, just some, you know, food for thought, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Chew it, spit it out, but Arab don't have no other meanings. They're really associating heavily to this stuff. And now that we know what a mustard rab is, that they're hijacking through the maternal line. <laughs> Arabic speaking Jews, but they're converts. They're not real Ibarus. Got it. <laughs> she said, got it. She said, that makes perfect sense. You, you, you you speaking clearly, Khan Khan. We're just talking Hebrew. We can't talk Hebrew. You know what I mean? Without talking the Kiber, the Hebrew, the Eber root. The Eber root. Well, you know, everybody want to hijack the Eber root. Behold, now the simple fact. Love the view zone.com. The Kaberi are the Kiberi or the people of the Kyber. And in Star Wars, they got the lightsabers with the Kyber crystals, right? Which is the Heber. The Kaberi are Kuberi, <laughs> like Kuba, the Hindu god of wealth and region of the north. So here comes the hijack because they want to put it in. India over there, not India Superior. That is in simple language, the Kyber, Kiber, which is also copper. That's where you get the word copper and, and cyber, put the CY, CYBER, K's and C's interchangeable. Its region is wealthy. Oh, we're talking the cities of gold, abundant in rubies. Gold is found in the rivers in its vicinity. <laughs> yeah, they're looking for the gold rivers here. And it was likewise the ruling northern power in those days. Yet, so Eber was the ruling power, right? We just got this, <laughs> the real heir proper. This is yet another important view in which the Kaberi are to be considered. They are the Hebrew eye or the Hebrews. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. Edward Pekok also provides us with enough information to intuit accurately the relations that the Phoenicians and the Jews had with India in ancient times. It is evident that the land which once set forth to distant conquests and the foundations of such thriving settlements, these Tartarian tribes must have vastly retrograded in the scale of civilization. Tartarian, again, they want to bring us to India over there. They, they, they want to throw their Tartarianness on the Presta. They want to hijack the scepter. We say Tartarian. Oh, you mean Grand Tartary which is connected to South America, which is North America. So your India, Kivera, can't be over there, man. Not when we have it on the maps over here, man. 
Annie. <laughs> yeah, we back in our Annie flow, my nigga. We back in the Annie flow. And we talking about Kivera, Eber, Annie. Kivera, America, Kivera, Annie. They changed Annie on to Arnon, right? But they're talking about bordering the Jordan and all this drop. So, you know, we're talking biblical land right here in America. And the uh, Kivera is what they're calling Tartary, or <laughs> we're just talking Asia, or <laughs> we're just talking India, Superior, my Naga. Come. Let's go. For the dismount. So this Grand Tartary, Tartarian Asia, all that, must have vastly retrograded in the scale of civilization. What can be said of the present semi-barbarous lands which produced the Hivites? For these were the people of Kiva or Hever, Heber, Eber, Joktan's Pops, Yucatan's Pops. It is but too evident that an immersed immense retro aggression and civilized life and in the arts of war and peace must have taken place in the Tartarian regions. We have no right to assume that any of the great families of mankind were less civilized than the Egyptians. We formed a component part of the same immigration. The people of Kiva, Eber, however, seem to have been scattered over the surface of Kama. The Hebrews were scattered, huh? Eber, Kiber, Kiva, Kuvera was scattered, huh? Though they are found principally in the vicinity of Gaza. Come on, man. Let us take now a view of the maritime portion of this remarkable country where the most interesting monuments still remain, establishing the fact that ancient Greek connection with India, so often alluded to by so many writers, so per pertinaciously denied <laughs> by some so called, by others, some suspected by others, there to the north dwell the singularly indigenous and the enterprising people of Phoenicia. We're talking Tarzanta because we got a Phoenician and Tarzanta, let's go. Their first home was Afghanistan. Now we're talking Afghan again. Just like we're talking Arab propers. We've been talking Afghan, man. Yeah, you got the book, thousand dollar book, right? Afghan, man. Because Afghan is the son of. Who we on? Oh, hold up. Going the wrong way. Yeah, man. All right, so Afghan again is the son of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. This is the reason why the ancient Israelites from the tribe of Benjamin are the rulers in Afghanistan. So they can't talk Afghanistan without talking to the tribe of Benjamin, Come, We got them exactly where we want them. We got them pinned against the wall right now, man. Jamming their ass up, jamming up their rib bones, man. Hijack City, you're going to feel this work because the ancient Israelites from the tribe of Benjamin are the rulers of Afghan. Why? Because the son of King Saul, one of his sons that they don't speak about is Jeremiah or Jeremiah who had a son, Afghan. Afghan is the grandson of King Saul. Jeremiah died approximately at the same time as Saul. Afghan has secured a high position in the rule of King David. So you can't talk Afghanistan without talking David because Afghan was in the court of David and the royal court of Solomon. You can't talk Afghan without talking the core of the Davidic dynasty, man. 
The first home was Afghanistan. I guess so. We're talking Hebrews. <laughs> that is the land of the Ophi, like <laughs> Ophir, uh-oh, or the serpent tribe or the dragons, my naga, whose symbol was the dragon, free fitting. This people was styled Bako, Bakanikoi or Bakanikoi or the or the Hayas. <laughs> my naga, is that hey Because, you know, sound like, look like Hayas to me. <laughs> We already know when we talk, hey, uh, we got to bring it on home. Bring it on home, man. Bring it on back. Bring it on back to Antioch. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Hey, you surfing away with me, my Nagi? You know I'm surfing away with you. Wow. You can't talk hey yeah without talking hawa, right? earlier form of Heya, the one who is the existing Hawa. They're talking Heya. Oh yeah, the Ethiopian nations, <laughs> the house of Hasharah. They're talking hey, we're talking Hawa. They're talking the highest, highest. We're still talking in the Ibaru from the Kiber, Heber to the Grand Quivera or Kivera with a K. And this is why it's on the map with a Q, U-I-V-I-R-A. And again, with a Q, U-I-V-I-R-A. It's also with a Q here or a K. <laughs> when India ruled the world, we're talking India superior, man. <laughs> Popping off, man, Preston. 98, we're talking Ania. The River Salmon, yeah. This is out the Lost Tribes, World History by Zevri Ben Dor Benite. Perhaps he also was attracted by the comment on the rapid tides, the tides that govern them, which may have struck him as a possible allusion to the River Salmon's mythical behavior. Using Ortelius's map, which places Azareth on the Asian side of the Straits, he was able to come up with a plausible trajectory leading the 10 tribes all the way to New Spain or Mexico. <laughs> Press the John, not too far from Mexico, right? So this is a separate document, man. <laughs> Mythical Straits of Antioch, right? Has placed Press the John and his idolatrous neighbors not very far from Mexico. We know he's fighting idol worshipers, right? It's a more and more war. Morocco. They're setting up idols. Morocco setting up idols, y'all. Muhammad in there, Mecca in there, the cube. Yeah, River Samania, where is it? Why is it seem to be connecting with this Antion flow? Another document said that the Samania might be found in the connection between Asia and Antarctica or Australia. <laughs> Let's go. 
using Ortelius' map, which places Azareth, Azareth, on the Asian side of the Straits, he was able to come up with a plausible trajectory leading the 10 tribes all the way to Mexico. The path he proposed also explains some of the American Indians rights and customs on the way from Azarif to the kingdom of Ania, not the river, the kingdom of Ania. Now we're talking about Anion Regnum, right? Still talking North America, America, Anion Regnum, R E G U, R E G N U M means kingdom. Covera, Anion, kingdoms, kingdoms, kingdoms. Take out their kingdoms, their dukedoms, their principalities. We're talking about near Mexico, <laughs> on the way from Azareth to the kingdom of Anion, the 10 tribes he asserts picked up some customs and rights observed in that kingdom and province, careful to provide a complete picture of the possible path to America. Some maintain Azareth is in Grand Tartary. You got over here, Aslan, right? <laughs> we know what's happening, man. We know where Grand Tartary is. That is said, it is said in Edris, it is across the river Euphrates. So Grand Tartary, Tartary connects with this river Euphrates. Then when we talk Tartary, and they call it Grand Tartary, <laughs> and it's just North America. That means Euphrates is right over here, boss and Cathay. Why wouldn't it be? We're talking about paradise. Grand Tartary, right? So Jen Broad, Jen Broad maintains Azareth is in Grand Tartary across from the river Euphrates. The 10 tribes went to the deserts of Tartary and from there to the land towards the island of Greenland. Oh, did Greenland just freeze over too in the Ice Age? Because in that part, it is said that America is not surrounded by sea, not surrounded by sea in Greenland. And in other parts, it is enclosed by the sea and it's almost an island. We're talking Greenland, right? Thus, we have at least three paths the 10 tribes could have taken to America. Atlantis. <laughs> I can't make this up. The Straits of Ania and Greenland. We'll be back in this document, man. We're just talking about the mythical Straits of Ania. British map, 1530. Presta John. America. India superior. Any uh... Yeah, we got the Anion Regnum. So we've been connected to Asia here, Asia there. All oh, this is Russia, right? <laughs> Oh, look at, uh oh, look what we found, my noggin. Look what we found for the dismount. Arsareth. Whoa. Arsareth is in Grand Tartary across from the river Euphrates. Arsareth. Right by the Strait of Ania. Now, where would the Euphrates be, huh? And it would be leading to the center of the world. Oh, Arzareth waters, you could take right to this, to the uh, center of the world, my nagas. 
You think it's play play? We got Annie on here, Arsworth here, and here we got Quavera with a Q. Kieber, Eber for the Eber rule. You see how you were holding down all this paradise leading to what? <laughs> paradise. Uh oh. Hey, man, we catching them slipping, man. The R9 is the Antion. They call it the border between Moab and the Amorites, right? Because they all are encroaching on paradise. The Fort of Antion. We'll be back, you know, digging on what they're saying about Antion, man, because, you know, they, they got things to say here and there. <laughs> now and again, they got something to say. Let's back it up. Out of the Lost Kingdom of Antion Regnum, Mystery of Ancient British Columbia, Canada. We talked about the Kingdom of Antion already, right? The mysterious Kingdom of Antion. Kingdom, my nugget. Antion Regnum, right? British Columbia, Vancouver, all this, right? So, Hubert Howe Bancroft wrote, it is scarcely possible to exaggerate the importance of this information given as it was by actors and the scenes represented, many of whom have departed from this life and all of whom will soon be gone to no small extent. It is early historical knowledge absolutely rescued from oblivion. You're being rescued, man, my naga, <laughs> of which if lost, no power on earth could reproduce. We're talking Ania. Arthur Reed Ropes writes, in the limbo of imaginary exploration, there is perhaps no more important, minutely mapped, and at the same time, fantastically varying country than that which includes the famous kingdom or province of Ania, with which the more famous strait of the same name. The history of this strait is remarkable enough to be worth setting down briefly, even though the proportion of fact to fiction in a narrative be of the slenderest. So they can't tell fact from fiction when it comes to Antia. This is what they say, man. This is what they talking about when they talk Antia. We're going to get back in it, though. Yeah, we're talking kingdoms and dominions, dukedoms and principalities. Pope Nicholas V issuing this 15, uh, 1452. This is the letter of war decree that they all use, Managa. All these treaties are based a lot on this. You know what I'm saying? Columbus came with all this manifest destiny based on this. We weighing all in singular the premises with due meditation and noting that since we had formally by other letters of ours granted among other things, free and ample faculty, to the aforesaid King Alfonso to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens. Subdue all Saracens. Talking the lost tribes of Israel, right? We're talking you. We're talking the Rus. We're talking the Saracen's head. Subdue all Saracens, man. Saracens, man. Israel are Sarah's sons, sons of Abraham, sons of Sarah. Daughters of Sarah and Abraham. Subdue all Saracens 
and pagans whatsoever. Oh, who's calling us a pagan? The Christian, enemies of Christ, wheresoever place in the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held in possession by them. What? <laughs> Subdue all these Nagas, the tribe of Israel, the seeds of Dawi, because they're enemies of our, of their anointing, which is Jupiter, which is Zeus. So if you're an enemy of Zeus, they came after you and took everything. They took your kingdoms and they took your dukedoms and they took your principalities. But we're still talking about Hanion, the kingdom and dominion. They took your principles, they took your kingdoms, they took your principalities, <laughs> they took your dominions, <laughs> they took Ania, changed it to Arna, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Now we're talking Barbary slave trade, my knock and to apply and appropriate to himself. Now we're talking Algier, Louisiana, Managi. Slavery, to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors, descendants, the kingdoms, the dukedoms, the counties, the principalities, the dominions, the possessions, and the goods, and to convert these Nagas to his or their use and profit. You think it's play play? Because they said they have authority. They have done it justfully and lawfully, acquired and possessed your islands, lands, harbors, and seas. They possess all that because they now belong to King Alfonso and his descendants. Descendants, successors, descendants of Europeans born in America can now take the title of the copper color tribes found here in America, which are the Khan. Because his successors now get the drop, right? What drop? your principalities, your dominions, and your kingdoms, and everything movable and immovable, man. You think it's play play? For the dismount. Lost Tries and Promised Lands by Ronald Sanders. I'm just back here in the prologue, man. Let's get it bigger. So, like I said, King David is is their Antichrist, is their Dajjal, they call it. But let's talk about this Kafir, right? Kafir, which means basically, you know, uh, someone who's a non-believer or, you know, whatever. So they're talking about this Catalan map, just recon the Catalan map. A relative secularization or at rate de-Christianization has set in and has not merely abandoned the pious symbolism of the traditional Matt Monday, but more significantly transmuted it. This change is most dramatically evident at the two extremes of the Okimini, the East and the West, now at the right and left instead of the top and bottom. <laughs> they changed all orientation. East and West, now at the right and left instead of the top and bottom. East and West used to be top and bottom. For at the furthermost east of the inhabited world, the Catalan map gives us not the terrestrial paradise, but Kambulak. Kambulak, a garden of Eden for worldly entrepreneurs like the Polos. Whoa. We're talking America presided over by the enthroned figure of the great Khan, 
rather than of Christ. Eeks. Whoa. <laughs> so Christ is a hijack. The great Khan is who is over the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and at the westernmost extreme on the, at, on the Atlantic, just beyond and above the Strait of Gibraltar, we see a figure at once decorative and useful that nowadays seems common enough on maps, but is making here its first known appearance on the world map, a compass rose. Now, if we consider for a moment the world model, the Gothic cathedral, this figure appears to be standing more or less in a position of the rose window. The change of content seems genuinely prophetic. Wow, so you know this, this map is giving them a different type of flow. It says, for one thing, the iconography is elsewhere on the map, rather free of explicitly Christian symbols. For, an, for another, there is an odd serenity about it all. Odd serenity, why? With nothing of the terror normally to be found in Christian visions of apocalypse and antichrist. There's something very serene about this antichrist. <laughs> what is it? What's serene about the anti they're anointed? What's serene about the apocalypse, the revelation, the revealing? The depiction of antichrist is especially startling. Why? In what is the largest and most elaborate scene on the map, we see a benevolent medieval monarch in a three-pointed crown, the only king, by the way, who is standing on the whole map, holding out two branches of a golden fruit towards his followers, nobles, clergy, peasants, burgeois, who are gathered around him in various postures of obeisance. They are surrounded by trees, flowers, and more of the golden fruit, all suggesting a dominion of abundance and tranquility. Why does this antichrist seem to be so tranquil, so serene, so oddly serene? Because the Antichrist for them, the Antichrist for the Muslim is King David. And the people that are at peace are the tribes of Israel, my naga. How can this man be anything but a savior? But there is nothing of the tradition imagery, traditional imagery of Jesus about him. There is nothing about Jesus about him, but he's a savior or one sent from Hawa who is our savior? Because <laughs> Hawa is our only savior, Isaiah 43. But David is sent. He is anointed. He got a covenant with the creator. So their depiction of an antichrist is startling, oddly serene, because it suggests a dominion of abundance and tranquility. Yeah, man. Something is very serene and tranquil about who they call their Kafur. But what did they say about the Kafur al Tarak? Page 44, indeed, it is very likely that some of identi identifications between Prester John and the King of Israel, between the remote realm of the Christians, so called, and the final refuge of the 10 lost tribe lies buried in the very sources of this legend. What does Preston John got to do with the King of Israel, King David? This possibility seems very close to the surface in the early Central Asian version provided by Hugh of Jabala with its intimate intimations of Tartars or Grand Tartary and of the kings of the Khazars. And remember, that's just Mazaka and Mosak. All these are Israel. All this is America. Only a generation after Bishop Hugh, the celebrated Jewish traveler, Benjamin of Tadula, described a relationship he had heard about between four of the, of the lost tribes and a nomadic people or wandering people called the Kofar al Tarak. And we don't rocked out about this al Tarak before, you know, connecting them to the so called desert tribes of the Prester. This is the, the mixed multitude. They were rocking with Preston John. They're rocking with King David. They're rocking with the house of Israel because there is a relationship between them. 
The Kofar al Tarak evidently were not Christians, but their purported relationship with some of the lost tribes resembles that of Prester John and could have had something to do with the making of the latter's legend. So Prester John got something to do with the Kofar al Tarak, but what's the Kafar? <laughs> for the dismount, my nine. We just putting this all together for the dismount. What's the Kafar? And love to the Aqua, man. Love to the Aqua, Tracy Lay, <laughs> who brought us back to this Dijon flow and the press to pack to look out for it. And yeah. They called it the Dijon the Great Deceiver. They call him the Great Deceiver, the infidel. The Dijon is sometimes said to have the word infidel. Remember, we just talked Antichrist, right? And what they say about the Antichrist is oddly serene, it's tranquil, because it's paradise, and there's one Khan who's standing on the whole map. And that's Islam's Antichrist. But it's so peaceful and so oddly serene. Now we're to the Kofar al Tarak that got some type of connection resembling that of Prester John. And what is a Kofar? They spell it K-O-F-A-R for the dismount. Love to Aqua Tracy Let. What is a Kofar? The Dajal is sometimes said to have the word infidel or kafar written in between his eyes, possibly on his forehead, but this word will only be perceived perceptible to true Muslims and no one else. So his third eye, his pine cone, will only the frequency would only be picked up by the true Muslims, the Arab proper, the people of a promise, love to let us find the truth. You see how we got right back here, man. It says he's blind in one eye. And there is written between his eyes, kafar, or unbeliever, right? Because he don't believe in no cries. <laughs> he don't believe in no cry. He don't believe in no Zeus. Very important is that the word kafir will be only readable by the believer. Non-believer, let him be educated <laughs> from Oxford and Harvard, will not be able to read it. Kafar. The Kafar is the Kofar al Tarak, the Kafar who they're calling anti Christ. We'll be back talking Daniel, man. We're going to get into this Daniel story even deeper, man. But, you know, that's for Preston 99. We're talking Dijal, Kafar for the dismount. The Kafar is their anti Christ. Got it. The Dijal has miraculous powers like Prester John. He can hold the power over the whole earth like Prester is, the, like King David. King David is their Antichrist. They don't want to talk Prester because Prester is their Dijal. They call him the fake Messiah or anti their Christ. Yeah, Islam has a Christ. <laughs> Islam and Christianity ain't too different. He will pretend to be the Messiah, deceive people by showing them amazing power. Now we're talking drag and drop, man. Who's the Kafar? Who's the Kafar? Al Tarak. Who's rocking with Preston John? <laughs> the Khan of Shimbala. And the Khan of Shimbala. Well, you got all the drop. You know this. You know this. For the dismount, for the triple trifecta dismount, like we always do about this time. <laughs> Top of the soul, bone, my nagi. Hey, welcome to. Hey, welcome to the future, man. And like I said, you know, reaching Preston one hundred is not a culmination of the entire investigation. It's just that. We reached a major checkpoint that we can all be proud of as Drive Nation, man. Because Preston John is the priest king of the Far East. Where you at? Where you at? 
We're talking magis like Baldazar, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. King of the Indies, huh? This is their Dijon. This is their Kofar. He don't believe in their power. He believe in Hawa. Catholic Encyclopedia Riley says, judging from the details of the letter, it is certain that the recipient was no mythical personage. So he's not a myth, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, sending the apostolic benediction to the famous and high king of the Indians. The Pope said that he had heard of him from many persons and common report and more especially from Master Philip, our friend and physician who had talked with great and honorable men of your kingdom. Well, we're talking about it too. We're gonna to talk to the honorable drop nation and get deeper into Preston John's kingdom and the 99th installment of the Preston investigation. It's all happening. They even said their uh, their Dijon I mean it's cray cray back to the cities of refuge are we back to talk in Louisiana we about to talking about Algiers, man. Here we go, man. Here we go. The coming of the Antichrist, the job must occur in the end of days. Yeah, Preston, whom I will raise up unto you. Got you. He will be Jewish. Oh, we're talking about the king of Israel. Got you. <laughs> Slain by Muslim, oh, he's slain by, oh, man. The Muslim Jesus <laughs> is who's going to take out King David, they say. Huh? <laughs> yeah, man. Okay. <laughs> so this is their story, my dog, and they stick it to it, man. Oh, they said somewhere that he's supposed to be holding a, a magic scepter or something like that, man. You know, <laughs> but there will be fire. Oh, we're just talking to Preston, man. Oh, wow. Oh, who, oh, who is Preston John? Who is the meteor thrown from the clouds with such violence? that by collision is set on fire. Who's the alchemical dragon that they want to slay with the coming together of opposites? Okay. And what is a cherub <laughs> in uh, 1828? Okay. An angel, different faces, you know. Ezekiel's vision got cherubs flying on the wings of the wind. Psalms 18, God, God. No more Morocco. Nah, you can't have India Superior. You can't have La China. You can't have Ania. You can't have Kavir. You can't have Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You, you can't have any of this, man. For Ham and Kush, Ham and Kush. Because we are flowing in Antioch. We are flowing to the promised land, to the mysterious kingdom. We are back. We are no longer a mythological, ridiculed, by word, Managa, you can't do this to us no more, Moab. You can't do this to us no more, Ma. The queens are back. 
The cons are back. And we surfing away. This was the 98th installment of the Preston John investigation. We do it for the Ox. We do it for the Aquas. And we're going to find out more and more about the more and more war in the next installment of the Preston series. The water for tuning in. Stay up. Suit up. Choose up.